All right, we're going to start the meeting. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the South Burlington City Council meeting for August 5th, 2024. We will start tonight with the Pledge of Allegiance. Who haven't I? Jesse, would you lead us, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Item number two, instructions on exiting the building in case of emergency and review of technology options. Jesse Baker, City Manager. Great. Thank you all for being here. Um, for those in the room, if there's an emergency, you can go out either side of the rear of the auditorium and then to the left or right to get outside. Uh, for those participating remotely, thank you for joining us as well. If you'd like to speak during any item on the agenda, um, you can either turn your camera on and the uh, chair will call on you or click the raise hand button, or you can indicate in the chat that you'd like to speak. Other than that, we are not monitoring the chat for content. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, Mike, can you turn your camera on and wave to the crowd um, so that we know that we have five city councilors, one is remote? There he is. Good evening, Mike. Nice to see you. You're muted, just so you know. All right. Um, so uh, item number three, which is agenda review. Uh, are there any additions, deletions, or changes in order of agenda items tonight? None? Okay, great, thank you. And now we come to item four, which is comments and questions from the public not related to tonight's agenda. Are there any? I see there are two. Would the lady in back like to come up and approach and use this podium here? And if you've never done before, there's a little button that turns green and it says push right on the base. Did that work? We can ah. hear you. And could you identify yourself, please? Yes. My name is Fran Delwitz, Francis Delwitz, and I'm a resident of South Burlington. And I... Could you just spell your last name quickly? Sure. Does this go up? Do I need more volume or... No, that's good. Okay. That's good. Um, it's D-E-L-W-I-C-H-E. -E. First name is Francis. Thank you. Do I have a time limit? Well, if I can talk really fast if I have to. You don't have to. Is <laughs> it right. going to take more than 20 minutes? Oh, gosh, no. Okay. Maybe two minutes. Okay, that's perfect. All right. So I'd like to voice my opposition to the plans to build the paved bike path and the paved and lit parking lot at the Hubbard Recreation Natural Area. I'm concerned about the environmental impact overall. But as a birder, I'm especially concerned about the impact it would have on the resident bobolink population. I'm sure you all know the bobolink is a bird. It's a pretty special little bird. It's a grassland species that prefers to nest in large, open, undisturbed meadows located away from human activity, just exactly like what is currently at Hubbard right now. For many years, I and many other South Burlington residents have enjoyed watching and listening to the bobolinks at Hubbard. However, recent population studies have shown that bobolink numbers have plummeted nationwide by as much as 75% in the last 40 to 50 years. That's primarily due to the direct loss of habitat. So when habitat is lost in one isolated field, the bobolinks living there might be able to find housing, if you will, nesting areas in some nearby area. But when that happens in a large scale basis, frequently in a geographic area, there's going to come to a point where the net result is the bobolinks are going to be effectively driven out. Um, and that could potentially contribute to the demise of the species, which we already know is under threat. So, therefore, I would like to ask, plead, if you will, that the City Council reconsider the 2023 decision to develop Hubbard. I'm concerned that putting a paved path through the middle of the meadow, or even if it is on to one side, will destroy the integrity of the ecosystem and inflict more people pressure on the bobolinks than they can tolerate. So I just want to say that I really appreciate all the time and effort that the council has invested thus far in trying to decide what to do with the Hubbard property. 
but I would really like to plead, let's just slow down, let's rethink this, and take the time required to get it right. Thank you. Thank you, Fran. Somebody else? Chris? <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Chris Shaw. I'm here tonight as the chair of the South Burlington Democratic Committee. And I've distributed to you, councillors, uh, a letter that comes from the committee. Dear South Burlington City Councillors, I'm writing on behalf of the South Burlington Democratic Committee, which has unanimously approved a request for the City Council's consideration. We kindly ask that a ballot initiative be placed for the March 2025 voting cycle, allowing all residents of South Burlington to participate in local elections on town meeting day and for any supplementary city, school, or bond votes. This initiative is crucial to uphold the Vermont tradition of town meeting and ensure that all residents, regardless of citizenship status, have the opportunity to contribute to our community's decision-making process. Similar measures have already been adopted by cities such as Montpelier, Burlington, and Winooski, highlighting the importance of extending this to our population. Expanding voter rights not only strengthens our democracy, but also promotes inclusivity and civic engagement. It particularly benefits new Americans, unhoused individuals, and other disenfranchised groups who contribute to the fabric of our community and deserve a voice in shaping its future. Vermont has been at the forefront of progressive voting policies, including same-day voting and extending voting rights to 17-year-olds in primary elections. Our proposed ballot initiative aligns with these efforts and underscores our commitment to fostering a more participatory democracy. Former South Burlington City Council Chair and Chittenden County Senator and Secretary of State Jim Condos was instrumental in these changes. Please continue South Burlington's proud track record in this fundamental key to a thriving democracy. We respectfully request that this matter be forwarded to the city's charter change committee with an expedited review process to ensure the initiative is placed on the ballot in a timely manner for next year's elections. Thank you for considering our request. Thank you, Chris. All right, uh, moving on to item five, which is councilors' announcements and reports on committee assignments and then the city manager's report. Since Mike is online, Mike, would you like to go first if you have something to report? Yes, sure. Um, before I do that, um, Jesse, could you please help me figure out where this, this is, this is very different than Zoom or Teams, this go to meetings. And I cannot find that hand. You said just go to the little hand at the bottom. So sorry to take up the time, but otherwise I'll just have to always turn on the screen and, screen and just wait. So on, on my GoToMeeting app, it's at the bottom left corner and it looks like a little hand and underneath it, it says React. Okay, on my computer, I do not have that. Okay. Okay, so I'll just have to do the turn on the screen and wave the hand. Okay, sorry. Sorry for taking up people's time. Um, yes, uh, since the last city council meeting on the 15th of July, uh, and for me, it wasn't through 24th of July when I headed off with my family for a holiday. Greetings to everyone from the nation's capital. Um, I uh, attended a, a very positive, very, uh, I think, a useful and productive uh, Safe Routes to School meeting. Uh, there was, I think, uh, as the council liaison, I'm sure Andrew will talk to this, but I was very happy that uh, the decision was taken to focus on one path and create a very positive experience. Uh, I think something that came out of it that I was very impressed about was the consciousness to have advanced communication uh, along the routes that would be going, uh, to be sure that uh, all the, com the community along those routes understood the objectives and what changes may be in this temporary model look like. Uh, and, but it also led to, which, which we see later on the agenda, an initiative uh, request of uh, both Andrew and I put forward to talk uh, based on the discussion that flowed out of this meeting about uh, the bus corner challenges into Rick Marcotte. Uh, but I thought that was a, a very 
a very, very good meeting of, of people participating and sort of slowly but surely crafting a way forward. Uh, also with uh, Andrew, I attended uh, a coffee with city council, uh, city councilor at uh, Orchard. Uh, you know, it's, there, it's, it's getting out there and popular. We've seen some uh, people have joined us before, have joined us again, or have joined us from previous meetings such as the retreat. Uh, but also came out some new faces that I had not seen before, uh, a couple that were advocating on behalf of uh, a neighbor of theirs who uh, is wheelchair, uh, mobility is based on wheelchair and, and raised the issue of paving of roads. So this uh, issue of paving of roads uh, comes up from time to time, it seems to be an issue that pops up around the city. Uh, and then uh, also uh, two mothers uh, stopped by who raised the issue and concerns about uh, the uh, playing fields, um, namely Dorset Park, primarily in Farrell, but also a bit the school in terms of drainage challenges and the challenges that both opposed to using these fields for sports activities. Um, then also just before leaving, I attended a series of meetings as the G, as the South Burlington Commissioner to Green Mountain Transit. Uh, there, uh, this is basically a tradition that uh, since I became the commissioner, we've been having quarterly meetings with uh, GMT, that is the city and also the school board. I think this has been timely because uh, I think as many people know, GMT is going through a, uh, a, a financial challenge where uh, they, they need to basically as mandated by the state legislature to come up by 15th of November, a plan to basically have a, a financially sustainable model uh, on the front of it, it, it looks like they're talking about 30% cuts and routes. Uh, I think this has all been in the press, but I'm just flagging it for people. Uh, but the, the the positive in this challenge is that it's an opportunity to reimagine South Burlington. Uh, as we all know, uh, public transit and uh, getting people out of single use cars and finding other ways to get around the city, both between municipalities, but very much so within our own municipality is one of our goals within the city plan. And uh, I think our, our series of meetings uh, has put us in a good position to actually partner as we had a meeting with uh, Williston and Shelburne and uh, just this morning participating in a meeting uh, with Jesse and her team and uh, Green Mountain Transit about how we would adjust perhaps assessments in a way that would more align it with the services that would be rendered to South Burlington. So I, I think I raised this in particular because uh, there is a time frame. As I said, this report needs to be put uh, to the state legislature by the 15th of November. Uh, the initial plans on the service reductions will be put out on, on publicly on the 27th of August, or we'll be decide, uh, confirming those in a uh, board meeting. And then in September, there'll be public meetings, public hearings, surveys uh, to get uh, feedback uh, with the goal of having a a final plan by the 15th of October. So I, I would, you know, the city council will be getting the survey, but so will be the broad public. So I really encourage people to participate. And we may want to think about in terms of our city plan where we uh, lay out engaging with GMT as a, if funds are available, uh, uh, priority uh, goal number 46. Um, you know, the window of opportunity is now. And so I think uh, it behooves us to uh, act in this time frame uh, if we basically want to have a way that the reimagining uh, aligns itself very much with our goals in the uh, city plan of 2024. So those would be my uh, participation uh, in the 15 or 10 days that I was in South Burlington prior to this holiday. That's it. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Mike. Lori? I don't have any committee reports to give tonight. Um, I did two weeks ago go to Thursday night out at um, Veterans Park, and it was incredibly well attended uh, with great music and a lot of good energy. And I love to see that growing and uh, would love to see some additional food trucks in the future to broaden the, the food spectrum available. But it was well attended, and I, I hope to see it keep growing like that. And um, on August 24th, uh, Andrew Chalnick and I will be doing another coffee with the council at uh, Chamberlain School from 9 to 10 and hope that uh, we have good attendance at that and look forward to talking with, with residents. Which food truck were you missing? 
Uh, we can get into that later. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But I thought it was the maple creamy truck was there, right? I believe the maple oh, creamy truck okay. was there. Yeah. I'm just I'm trying to. Okay. But that doesn't balance blood sugar well. Oh, you're right. <laughs> Good point. Uh, Elizabeth. Um, I also had no committee meetings, um, but I did participate in two of the public hearings associated or sponsored by the Planning Commission regarding the LDR changes that are going to be presented to Council uh, at our next meeting on August 19th. Um, and then only moments ago participated in the Board of Civil Authority meeting in preparation for the August 13th election. Um, I also had the opportunity to attend the Sobu Night Out uh, with family that were visiting from out of town and there was high praise for the fireworks with they which they say they rivaled Disney which is wow. pretty good praise I thought um, the I do have an article coming out in the other paper um, on Thursday which really highlights the contributions of our parks our city maintained and other um, park space areas around the city and um, uh, it also highlights the uh, master plan activities coming up and really solicits feedback or uh, participation from community members, both in that master planning process as well as the um, uh, committee work where we have openings and we'll be interviewing soon for those. Um, and lastly, I had uh, folks visiting from out of town that um, I thought it was notable that they rented a car at the airport and they got an EV vehicle and the rental rates were favorable compared to gas uh, powered vehicles, which I was very impressed with. And they were as well. Thank you, Andrew. Sure. So um, I also attended the planning commission public hearing and the BCA meeting. I thought the planning commission and staff um, really did a great job. I know we'll be talking a lot more about that in an upcoming city council meeting. But there was there was a lot done there. Um, as Mike uh, mentioned, him and I um, also attended a coffee with a counselor in the San Francisco school. So um, Mike mentioned uh, most of the things that came up with uh, the coffee with the council. I do want to just stress a couple though. Um, there is there was a, a couple there advocating for a woman who is handicapped and lives on Elizabeth Street. And I, I've been to that street. Actually, I've been to the person's house, and the the sidewalk there is in really bad shape, and the road is in really bad shape. And because of that, um, this person is is basically trapped in in their home. Um, they just they just can't navigate um, uh, outside, right? Um, given given their disability. So I know we're doing a sidewalk inventory. I know we do a road inventory, and. Um, I'm looking forward to both of those to see how we can help um, this person on Elizabeth Street. Um, there was another person there who spoke about, and folks may have noticed um, from the airport, there's been an uptick in the number of um, smaller planes that are flying over South Burlington. And this person said that they've investigated, and apparently there's... An exam and I guess there's um they're actually using leaded fuel um, apparently there's an exemption for small planes through 2031 that allows them to use leaded fuel and so those planes which are becoming pretty frequent are spewing leaded fuel um, over our community and without more we'll do so for the next seven years so um, I know this council doesn't have any direct authority over that but it's something that perhaps we can exercise some indirect authority over it's certainly an issue that concerns me greatly so um, that was brought up by another resident. Okay. Um, two other things, safe routes to school. So, yeah, Mike did um, mention a couple of things that happened there. So, you know, I think when that task force was created, the hope and plan was that this fall, the task force would come up with routes for all of the schools and then present those routes both back to council and to the school board. And then we can begin to prioritize obstacles and work on the routes. Um, I think... In hindsight and over time, the task force determined it was probably too ambitious that to get the appropriate public engagement for all those routes and all the schools district is just 
not within the bandwidth of the task force now. And given that um, the Rick Marcotte principal and the and the teachers and the, the staff have really been focused on this initiative for Rick Marcotte, we decided that let's focus on that one school for the fall, come up with a really good plan, work it through, know that it works, and then come back to the other school districts in the spring. Um, so that's that's the current plan, a little bit different than the original plan. I attended the Green Mountain Care Board presentation on health care costs that I thought was really, really interesting. So it was a very detailed presentation, like chock full of data. But for me, the bottom line was that premiums may go up around 20% um, for all you know payers of the full premium, which is a, a pretty whopping number if that's what happens. And the question that this presentation was supposed to answer is why, right? What are the key drivers for that? And there was kind of mention of inflation, housing, and other things. Um, I asked a question because inflation only accounts for like, a, just back up, over the past decade, premiums with this have doubled. And inflation has been about 20% over the past decade. So inflation accounts for about a fifth of that. Housing has gone up, but housing is part of inflation. It really doesn't explain it. And housing's gone off all around the nation, and our premiums have zoomed ahead of other states. They reference Massachusetts. Housing's gone up far faster than Massachusetts and Vermont, but premiums there have been flat. So that doesn't really explain it either. They talked a little bit about that we have our population skews older, and so perhaps that also because you don't have the same base of young people paying maybe more for the care they get because they use less services. But in my mind, I didn't really get um, from the presentation the drivers of these really exponential increases. And there were some really interesting comments made by the public. There were a couple of independent providers that came up and talked about how they provide much cheaper, more efficient services, but they have a hard time staying in business because the hospital <laughs> hires all the staff away by paying bigger bonuses. So I think there's a lot to talk about there, a lot to unpack and a lot to understand and uh, a lot of work to do on healthcare costs. So. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Um, so uh, I attended uh, the Public Arts Committee meeting and they're getting excited about um, the uh, creation installation of that uh, that piece of artwork that's going to go to J.C. Park, and so am I. So that's uh, coming up. Um, I also attended the Pension Advisory Committee meeting, uh, which uh, at that point, the total value of the fund was around $46 million before today. I'm not sure what it is today, but that's okay because the market goes up and the market goes down. <laughs> you can always bet on that. That's what you can bet on, right? Uh, I did attend a BCA meeting uh, remotely. I also went to that Act 167 healthcare transformation meeting that Andrew talked about, and I did not have the time to stick around and ask my burning question, which is, well, when I was in the Peace Corps, uh, we were given a book about this thick called Where There Is No Doctor. And I'm wondering whether we need to start passing it out in middle and high school so that kids understand what self-defense health care is going to look like in the future, right? Because the first line of defense for most people should be their primary care providers, and they're under duress right now because of the amount of money that they get reimbursed, even through Medicare or other services, as Andrew referred to. it. That example is an OBGYN doctor who was having trouble with her practice, but was pretty good at comparing her prices for delivering a baby versus in the hospital. But I, I didn't really get a chance to ask that question, how we boost up the primary care providers because they're the first level defense to keep people out of the emergency departments. And uh, I wish we'd had that cap that possibility. And, and the schools, I mean, we've, every person that comes through a community needs to understand what the limitations of a healthcare system are, what their resources are, and how to best use them without straining them um, so that everybody gets to use it equally, I think. So that's, it really is a self-defense healthcare issue, and I, I don't know how we get around that. But the, the cost issue uh, is is a real risk to uh, future um, care. Uh, I did attend that Planning Commission public hearing, and uh, my sister from Halifax, Nova Scotia, was here for the weekend. So I said, Teresa, we're both fifty five over fifty five years old. Let's go to Veterans Memorial Park and take part in the Park and Rec's um, free barbecue. 
because they're going to have hamburgers, hot dogs, cheeseburgers, and uh, potato salad, coleslaw, and pe- pasta salad. So we went up and had a really great time. And Rebecca did a great job organizing that, and Travis was there, and uh, we sat and talked to uh, the seniors. And I answered a lot of questions uh, about about city council. It was almost like barbecue with the city councilors, what it turned into. Um, But it was a a good time to be there. And let me just tell you, it was hot. (laughs) What a really hot weekend, including Friday. Um, The Thursday before that, uh, I met a friend I haven't seen in probably six or seven years. Uh, We were in the Peace Corps together, and we met at the Maple Street Park in Essex Junction. I can't tell you, there must have been about 250 people on the grounds of that pool, either in the pool or in the shade, on the grass, having snacks with their kids, families, teens. Everybody was there, and they were hitting the snack bar, and I was like, oh, it would be kind of nice if we had pool in South Burlington. And then this echo from Tom Chittenden just started going through my head. So uh, I just want to make that comment that, you know, as things get hotter and the quality of the water in the lake might not be so great because of cyanobacteria, because of heating, might be that pools, outdoor pools in the summertime are the best relief. Um, I also, without preempting the, the, the city manager, want to give a quick thank you to the South Brilliant Police Department and the Brilliant Police Department for their quick thinking and action with what happened on Brewer Parkway last week. Um, and, and I'll let you go into some detail on that. No? So um, uh, we at the Pension Advisory Committee meeting, um, I think Officer Moore was able to give us some background. So if you don't know the story, a gentleman was called in uh, from a 911 call that he was harassing people with a knife down by the Lowe's, Hannaford, Tesla area. Um, the officers raced to the scene. They, were, they got there. They couldn't get to him because he was on the side of a fence. He ran over to the, the water district and hijacked a pickup truck there um, and almost uh, injured the lady who had left the pickup truck running to go get some paperwork out of the office uh, but missed her. But at that point, they arrived, and the police arrived and deployed tire spikes. And so this person ran over the spikes exiting that property. And so then eventually had to go on foot, ran onto Brewer Parkway, went into a home where there was a 74-year-old woman whom he took immediate hostage with a knife. Um, a Burlington and South Burlington uh, police officers, they, they went in and immediately just tackled the person and uh Nobody was severely injured with any life-threatening injuries. There were some lacerations. Both police officers, one was a Burlington detective, did get out lacerations requiring stitches. Uh, the woman received some uh, lacerations as well. And uh, you might have seen her speak on the Channel 3 News a couple nights later about how uh, secure she felt from all the love from her friends and neighbors, how that good that made her feel. And uh, she felt very lucky. And uh, just personally speaking, uh, I had somebody relate to me that one of the first things that she asked after it was over was, how is that man doing that attacked me? Her concern was for him. And I just find that totally amazing really, really amazing um, empathy for whatever that person was going through. So, uh, and, and I want to thank the chief uh, for going down and having a private meeting on Brewer Parkway in one of the households, uh, along with a rep from the CJC to meet with the neighbors and talk with them about what happened um, and, and get their feedback and uh, also, you know, urge them to, you know, make sure you lock your, your car doors on your cars and lock your front door in your house if, if you're home. And, you know, about the things that the police can and can't do. So we're really appreciative of Chief Burke and his and all of his police officers for that event. Um, can, can I add one piece of information? That's sure. a great summary. Yeah. Just um, for community awareness, the time it took from when the officers encountered the gentleman in the Champlain Water District facility to him being under arrest in the home on Brewer parkway was less than five minutes so it's an incredibly fast event with very quick decision making and we are incredibly fortunate for the training of our professionals and that nobody's nobody was significantly injured right right training training is so key there and i mean anyway um the the uh last thing i wanted to talk about was um Oh, we also attended the uh the bca meeting tonight with andrew and elizabeth and lori um so we have uh, Helen Reilly scheduled for August 19th on our agenda to give a report uh, because she is on the airport commission and hasn't reported in a while. So we'll have that at the next meeting. And that's all I have. Thank you. Great. 
Um, thank you. A couple of updates uh, from us tonight. Um, so the 835 Heinsberg Road, which is the um, case on the um, habitat blocks on the large parcel kind of right south of Tilly Drive, um, that has gone to the Supreme Court for consideration, U.S. Supreme Court for consideration about taking it up. Um, that will be heard by the conference court whether they will take it up or not on September 30th. So we should know a few weeks after that whether that will go to a full U.S. Supreme Court case or not. Um, it's an exciting week for speaking of our fabulous to police department. For our police department, we have three new officers starting this week at the 118th Police Academy. Um, they will be there through the uh, end of summer and fall and then in field training through the winter and hopefully on the street by the spring. Um, we're really excited to welcome them on. Um, I did, at the request of one of the counselors, want to give a quick update on the spill at the Vermont National Guard base. And Bob Fisher, our uh, wastewater superintendent, is in the audience. So when I screw up what he has taught me, please come up and interrupt me, Bob. Um, so uh, there have been no additional remediation efforts at the plant since July 3rd. It was all cleaned up by then. Uh, the testing does continue um, on an intermittent basis, but regular testing of the uh, water that is leaving the plant. Uh, Vermont DEC and Bob are in close contact about that. What they are finding is while there are um, some traces, they appear to be decreasing and are not um, violating any of our conditions at this point. Um, the unknown still is in the biosolids, as we have previously talked about, those residues could stay in the biosolids for much longer. Um, we are continuing to, um, with partnerships through the state and the guard, um, uh, transport those and isolate them from other streams and other communities and continually test them. So we are seeing the levels of those biosolids increase. Um, which is not great, but they are still within the beneficial reuse category. So while the, the um, negative factors are increasing, and it's still likely that we can reuse those now, but we will continue to monitor that for um, weeks and months to come to make sure that it stays within that reasonable level. Um, we have an agreement with the guard that they are covering the additional cost associated with that trucking of the biosolids and um, quarantining of them. So we are continuing to pay only what we historically have paid for that action. Any delta above that, the guard is covering. So we as the city are um, only paying for that, which we, we would pay for through normal operations. And the, they're directly invoicing the guard for that. Um, we are in talks with the Guard around the disposal of the liquids they collected on site. Um, so the options right now, there's about 20,000 gallons. Options right now are to figure out a way to put that through our processing system or to truck it to, you told me this, Idaho, which is a considerable cost as one can imagine. Um, so no decision about that has been made. That will be made with Bob, the engine, environmental experts, and the state before any action is taken. More or less okay, Bob? Perfect. Okay, thanks. Um, and then for council... Um, I have a question about that. Kit. Um, mm -hmm. Did we ever get initial test results? I know we heard tests were done. Um, we were supposed to get results. So I've never heard them. There's testing done the first day, yep, two, we, three, we, five, yep. seven, and what those tests showed? Yeah, so we have... Bob has uh, been in very regular contact both with the guard and... Um, the testing professionals. Uh, we are getting results on those. I will let him summarize those. Um, yeah, they um, they have. They have. We have. Do no, no, I'm sorry. They've done numerous testing through their contractor Atlas. Plus, we have all the. We have done quarterly testing um, through a contract with the state. They had done with Weston and Sampson. So we had uh, three sets from the three previous quarters to compare against. Um, at the moment, uh, I just received the results actually from the guard today. Uh, the numbers are are up compared to where they were, but they're nothing. We didn't see anything excessive at all. I just want to be clear. So I'm not talking about where the um, affluent is today. I'm yes. just I'm interested in knowing the day after, three days after, seven days after, what the levels of PFAS were in the water that was going into the lake. Do do we know that? 
we we would know the level leaving our facility. Um, our uh, I only got those results today, so unfortunately, I did not have time to. Uh, I got them midday today, so I can uh, cal I can go through that more and and, and respond to that. But just That'd to great. just Thank to you. clarify, we put up about 0.3 percent of the flow into the river at that day. We did two million gallons, but the river is significantly larger, so. I can't say what entered the lake. I could say what was entered the river, the 0.3%. That's what I meant. Right. Where, the, where the wastewater treatment, yep. where the wastewater can, leaves the treatment plant, what the, you know, um, density of PFAS was in that water compared yep. to what it was before the accident. Yep. And and I went, after I spoke to the colonel today, they did forward all those to me about one o'clock or so. So I haven't really had time to go through them yet. Bob, it was my understanding, though, that at the time when Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation was very engaged with us in this, it was still within the permittable limit. So there is no real permit li limit. There's only a permit limit for our biosolids. There is no, there is, the state has just started as part of our permit to do testing for monitoring. There is no limit for PFOS. We have a limit for many things that we've had in our NIPTES permit, our National Police charge elimination permit. There is no PFOS. So was it dangerous per the DEC the, f the week after? I'm sorry, what? Was it deemed dangerous by the DEC the week after, I think is what Andrew is trying to get at. I, I just want to know the parts per million parts yeah, per billion. I, I, just, yeah. I just want to know the number that came out of the testing. I can, I can not go through that, that in the next couple okay, of days because I just received those today. I had to ask for them again several times. Thank you. Thank you. And we could share that with the whole council. That'd be great. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so just a couple of other quick updates. Um, just a reminder to the council and the community that uh, committee applications are due August 12th. Right now, every single committee needs additional applicants, but for economic development. Economic development has the same number of applicants as vacancies, and Recs and Parks has more. So good job for those interested in Recs and Parks. But everybody else needs additional applicants, so please uh, encourage your neighbors to apply. Um, Several of you mentioned um, interesting recreation and parks activities happening, just as um, kind of circling back, July was Recreation and Parks Month. Our uh, Strong But Mighty team did a different adult fitness activity in across our parks through the month of July. We had 31 days for 31 days. This is unheard of that they didn't have to cancel any event because of weather. Uh, which is really fantastic. And we had a total of 352 people um, come through different um, new programming. So that is transitioning into, because of the success of that, transitioning into an adult fitness monthly membership, repeating many of those programs at different locations throughout the city uh, while the weather cooperates and then potentially into the mall after that. Um, and then also unrelated to the adult fitness, um, we will um, be announcing in the, or you will start seeing announcements in the next couple of weeks about um, October 12th, which will be a girls sports festival. Um, our Parks and Rec director has partnered with instructors and students at UVM Athletics and St. Michael, Mike, Michael's Athletics uh, to do different stations of sports throughout the day for young women um, to get familiarity with different sports. Um, just a reminder, August 14th is the City Green Community Meeting here at 6.30. Um, that's the second meeting where the, um, present, where the consultants will be presenting their concepts. Um, August 16th is Bennington Battle Day, so the city, will, city Hall will be closed. Of course, your public safety team will be here for you. And then the council is meeting on August 19th for regular meeting, 20th and 21st for council interviews. So big council meeting week. Thanks. What, 19th and 20th and 20th? What? I, 19, uh, I didn't know. I'm just kidding. I knew about you. Mark your calendars. Wow. Thank you. What time is the meeting on the 16th? The meeting on the, maybe I misspoke, 14th. On the 14th. The City the 14th, Green yeah, the is City at 630. 630. The 16th is Bennington Battle Day. Okay. And the library's closed. Yep. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, item number six, consent agenda. Uh, this is a really long consent agenda here. Uh, before I start reading all these off, it is, I'm just straw vote. Is the council amenable to, are they thinking about passing all these or are there different definite items you want to pull out before? 
I, I definitely want to pull the uh, notice of conveyance for the Wheeler Park Conservation Okay, so let's, let me go through them, right? And then we'll, we'll come back to you and talk about those items. Okay. So here's the consent agenda, everybody. Uh, item A is consider and sign disbursements. B is approve minutes from the May 20th meeting. C is approve the notice of conveyance for the Wheeler Park Conservation Easement in compliance with 24 VSA 1061. D is receive the hazard mitigation plan progress report. E is authorize the city manager to sign an amendment to the city lane plowing agreement extending it one year. F is approve resolution 2024-17 updating the city ambulance fees. G is approve the selection of Kruger to provide the biological process and SCADA upgrade with real-time cloud-based process optimization system for the Bartlett Bay Wastewater Treatment Facility. H is approve and execute the lead service line inventory loan application. I is authorize the city manager to utilize $100,000 of rental registry enterprise funding to create temporary office space with an office trailer to be located at 575 Dorset Street and authorize the city manager to secure any permits or execute any contracts necessary for the completion of this project. And lastly, J, approve the city manager to enter into a stormwater maintenance agreement with 3NSB LLC for the construction of Garden Street West. Did you all get that? Okay, good. So uh, I have, so Elizabeth, you're talking about uh, item C, which is the Wheeler conveyance? Correct. And I would like to talk about the city ambulance fees, which is item F. And Lori or Andrew, any others? And Mike, I'll get to you in a second. <laughs> the hand went up. I think I'm good. You're good? I'm good. Okay, Mike? Yes, in my particular case, I, I just wanted to, for the record, recluse myself from the Wheeler Park. It adjusts uh, the neighborhood I, I live in, and obviously there are financial uh, impacts on my neighborhoods. So I, I think that to, to be sure that there's no perception of... Uh, conflict of interest on that particular issue, I would risk losing myself. So we don't know, but we're, I'm going to let Liz, Elizabeth talk about Wheeler for a second here, but just hold that thought, Mike. And, and when we get to a point, if we do want to vote it, I want to try and change your mind, just so you know. I may be unsuccessful, but I'm going to try, okay? So, Elizabeth, what do you want to talk about with Wheeler Park Conservation Easement? Uh, yes, well, one, um, uh, thanks for all the information and background, Colin in particular, we're getting me up to speed on this. Um, I did want to just disclose, maybe similar to Mike, um, that in uh, looking at conservation easements, there is there is some guidance that was developed in consultation with Vermont Assessors and Listers Association, Vermont Housing Conservation Board, and the Vermont Land Trust that indicates um, that a property with development limitations may enhance the value of neighboring properties and it uses land adjacent to property subject to a conservation easement would be receive a benefit similar to one adjacent to land conserved by state or federal governments. So I did want to just disclose that I belong to an HOA, which I wasn't entirely aware till I saw the map of the conservation easement that does butt up to the property on both the south and east side. Um, it is not directly uh, associated with property I own. Um, and there's no land ownership with my HOA, but I did want to just disclose that information um, in the spirit of full disclosure and what I learned um, relative to um, the land valuation process in Vermont. Thank you. Um, for those who were on the council, I think it was 2000, summer of 2017, there was a committee whose job was, it was a, ta excuse me, it was a task force to um, to research uh, what it would take to put a conservation easement on Wheeler. And that activity, uh, I think it took about six months, and this easement work has been <laughs> a line item for a very long time. And I'm surprised Michael Mittag isn't here. Maybe he's on vacation, but uh, he's, he's here. He's, he is, here. Oh, is he? Oh, he's remote. There he is. Uh, he is, the, I would say, the number one foremost proponent of this easement. And um, I just want to remind people that there are already two existing Act 250 easements on that property uh, that were put there before 2017 uh, as part of other development agreements within the city. So there's nothing 
uh, nefarious or underhanded about this conservation easement. And Mike, I'm going to try to convince you that there is no reason to recuse yourself. Uh, this property, as we know, is owned by the city and already has already has two outstanding conservation easements on it. There was work done by a task force a long time ago to get this work done. Uh, Michael's been running behind this subject matter for quite a long time, and we're on the verge of, of doing this now. So I don't see any reason for you to recuse at all, uh, but of course you can if you'd like to. Um, you know, that's a wonderful park that is uh, visited by hundreds of people over the course of a week walking the trails. Uh, incredible views to the east of the of Mount Mansfield, um, and uh, it has a nice uh, community garden area as well. Uh, it's also excluded from that is the you know the common roots part of the Wheeler House itself. So anyway, I'm just trying to put a plug in there for you, Mike. I don't I don't I don't I don't think you need to recuse. And uh, Elizabeth, let me ask you: Do you still want to vote on this? Yes, I'm just disclosing that information. Okay, thank you. Tim, can I add to what you said? That sure. I think it's also zoned park already. And so the, the easement is not going to change the use of the property. It's not going to change the value of the property. It's really just, um, I think, to give the public assurance that it's it's going to stay park. So that's, that's, I think, something else to consider. I have a question request, maybe. Um, since this issue of recusal is one that has been around many times and there are some definite gray areas here, I was wondering if by chance, since our council is in the room, whether we could possibly get a quick primer on when it is and isn't appropriate for a recusal to help us as council members know a little better what our guidelines are around that issue, or whether to do that at another time. Well, it's not really on our agenda tonight, but if it won't take too much time if there's a quick explanation for that. It's not on the agenda, but it is pertinent to yeah, this vote. I understand. Good evening, Colin McNeil, City Attorney. Um, just a Brief overview, um, we currently have a conflict of interest in ethics policy uh, that, this, that you as a council have adopted. As we talked about maybe a couple of weeks ago, we're probably going to be adopting a new one that is a municipal code of ethics policy that has been supported by the Vermont legislature. That is really the guidebook on where to go as to whether you have a conflict or don't have a conflict. Um, as a council, as a, as a body and individuals who have been elected um, it is largely up to you to determine whether you have whether you have a conflict of interest or not. It could be a direct or indirect conflict. It could be a conflict of someone in your family. Um, but the policy is really what outlines what those requirements are. If your conflict is, is similar to other people who are in a similar situation as you, it's a very close call to whether you do have a conflict or not. Um, and the the explanation that is given by the Vermont League of Cities and Towns and that we've used is that uh, you, you approve a tax rate. Uh, this tax rate is going to affect you the same as it would other similarly situated people. Um, I think I've also given an example of, say, you have a, um, you're on the council and you're approving a bike path uh, and you think it'll really benefit you because you like to ride your bike. Um, there's lots of other people who really like to ride a bike too. But at the same time, if you are the person that owns the contracting company that's going to be installing the bike path, that's a little bit different, and um, we're, we're probably lean towards the, the chance that you have a conflict. Um, those are just some outlines, uh, but I would really just refer to the policy at this point. We can get into more detail if you want at a later time. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, Mike, you uh, do not live in the condos uh, at uh, Dorset Park. You live uh, in a—is it? Are you still part of the HOA? Yes, I'm um, single family owner, part of the HOA. But your your so property it's the is collected value. You, you, Pardon? I'm thinking of the. Anyway, so I'm I'm trying to think about the properties and how they abut Wheeler, right? So, but I, I guess that's irrelevant. Right. Well, since that you're whole part complex of abuts Wheeler. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, as I shared with you and Jesse, I've in doing research on this, I came across articles that imply or seems to suggest from studies that. Uh, neighborhoods that adjust have benefits uh, in terms of property value just collectively improving 
Um, and you know, there's plenty of people on the, the council uh, to, to, to make this decision. If, if this was part of the master plan for uh, city and open space, you know, it was in that kind of context when we're talking about uh, equal benefits to all neighborhoods and you know, there's a perception of that, you know, you know, you know that, that, that would be a different question. But here there's a specific question that has a direct uh, implication, a financial one based on these studies, uh, or at least see, these studies seem to indicate then I see there's no point in uh, in some people's mind who may live in other parts of the city may perceive that I will receive some benefit from this. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that uh, I would love to maintain my perception of that I'm trying to be a representative. We are a large system. If it was a ward system, perhaps it would be a smaller concentration of people. It would be a, a different perspective. But since uh, I've uh, been elected to represent all the neighborhoods, I just want to be sure that I maintain a, a sense in everyone's mind, neighborhoods far and large, that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to look at everyone's uh, interests uh, collectively. So I would just say one more thing, Mike, is that um, there, sure. there is no real change of use that happens with that property after the conservation yeah. easement is executed. Uh, the, the, it'll be open the same way it was before. Um, sure. It'll just be more codified as to what you can and can't do uh, in terms of development right. of the property. I mean, nothing has been built on that property since it was purchased by the city, except for the pizza uh, oven uh, hut. You know? And so, what I'm trying to say I'm is that if the, it, what I'm trying to know, say is that if there, if all there all was the if there was any financial benefit to your HOA, it happened a long time ago before you ever moved in there. Right. Okay. That's the only point sure. I want to make. So that's another reason why I think. Fine. I don't thank you. Thank you for making it. We enjoy it tremendously. Uh, but again, uh, at least in this, uh, the, 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 the articles of studies uh, that I've looked at, have suggested that uh, there's a perception, or at least based on these studies, that once you have the permanent conservation, it provides a a a, a, a benefit. And again, you know, we don't think this is going to affect the outcome of this uh, in any way. Um, but I, I think I want to, from my sense of own uh, integrity to everyone, every neighborhood that I represent in this great city of St. Burlington live to, uh, you know, I, I will always basically try to be sure that I'm uh, even handed. Uh, and again, I, I very much look forward to the master plan for uh, open space and uh, parks. I very much look forward to all our plans. Actually, this is something we'll be talking about later on. Uh, I think it's very critical that we basically put all these sort of broad plans into play simultaneously, which will then ensure that as we go forward and make decisions on how we spend uh, our our fellow residents' tax money and how we make plans in terms of prioritization are balanced because we've uh, put into place all these very comp uh, competing plans that in many ways will complement each other, but will also force us to make uh, decisions in a way, hopefully that will be as equitable to all the different neighborhoods uh, of our very diverse city. So Mike, let me just ask this one question. Do you or do you not support the administration of a or, or the the deployment of a conservation easement on the Wheeler property. But then that's my position on this point. Then the, the, what's the point of recusing myself if I say? Well, that? No, you can recuse yourself because you can say because of this other research I've done, I don't think that I, I have a, I should be able to vote this, on this, right? But the question I'm asking this is, you is: that's do you what support? I'm just saying. That's what I just do, said. do you support a conservation easement on the Wheeler property? Yes or no? That's all. So. I, I, I need to step I've in here that to support my, I'm just my, both to my counselors. Recuse, that's all. So are your current calling, correct me if I'm wrong, your current policy says it's up to individuals to decide if they have a conflict correct. and to make that choice for themselves and recuse. If somebody correct. is recusing from a conversation, it. they shouldn't be put in the position of voting. Sorry, Tim. That's okay. I mean, that, that was my understanding from... I'm just, Our first briefing of the, the, uh, the policy that we passed. I understand. I'm just so trying I'm to apply myself a little common sense pressure to you, Mike, to, to get you to change your, your position. Okay, that's all. Uh, Tim, this is why you're the chief. This is why we elected you to be the chair. To, that's why we're to, here. To navigate it straight through. So I've got one more quick comment sure. to make, which, um, and I totally respect your decision, Michael, and I'm not saying this to try and change your decision, but as I listen to what Colin said about recusal, what I heard was that if the impact that something has on me is a similar impact to other people in a similar situation, I like to bicycle, I'm voting on the bike path, um, it may impact the value of my house, but it's going to impact the value of other houses that abut, whatever, that in that case, recusal 
is not necessary. I understand your desire for total integrity, but I just wanted to clarify my understanding of what um, Colin said so that um, we all figure out how we make our own personal decisions around it. Sure. Well, thank you, Laura. I appreciate you uh, you respecting my my decision. Um, but as I uh, you know, I spent thirty years in the federal government, and you know, I basically have come out of a culture where uh, any perception is enough to recluse yourself. Uh, as I think I answered uh, earlier, is you know we are at large. You know, if, maybe if I was just a ward, and that ward was a more sort of around that particular area, we all were to benefit. Uh, from this, uh, as uh, these studies indicate, then uh, it would be a different issue. But you know, we're at large. I represent all the neighborhoods, and so my view is that uh, in this particular case, I would be receiving a potentially a, percent, a benefit that other neighborhoods want. Again, I, I look forward very much to a comprehensive plan of open space, uh, open right plans, including the all the other plans that we're supposed to have in our city plan that give us this ability to have a comprehensive discussion about how we prioritize how we spend our money. So, you know, thank you for asking the question and I hope you continue to respect my answer. Thank you. Michael, do you have a brief comment? Yes, and it might help Michael uh, to remind him that uh, about 60% of the voters um, in South Burlington who voted on this plan to have an easement um, in exchange for a land swap there was a 60% pro in favor of the easement uh, at the time, and there was a commitment by the city on that basis to do this easement. So I don't think Mike, Michael uh, has a reason to think that the cities, that all the city's citizens weren't represented in, in coming to this decision. So it had been a long time to get here, but that was the origin of it. 60% of the voters on that particular ballot item approved it. Thank you, Michael. All right, so we're gonna leave item C on, and now we're gonna to move to the discussion about item F. Um, and the only issue I had was the addition of uh, charging a service fee for when there's no transport. And uh, this has not been done before by our city, and as far as I can tell, it's not being done by a lot of other cities in Vermont, and I'd like to have, I'd like to pull this and have some time to study it. And, and call some other people, and, and including some insurance agencies, to find out uh, what the effect would be on, on rates and things. So um, that's, I don't know how the rest of the, I, I'm really worried about this in terms of the fact that if you, and, and maybe you can answer this question now, you're called to uh, a scene, right, and somebody needs care. Um, if they are lucid, and would you be asking them, would you be telling them, first of all, they can decline to be transported, right? So hey, currently, they can they can they can take some treatment, but decline transport, and there's no charge. Correct. That is that is correct. And in the future, you might treat them, but if they decline transport, you would still charge them, or charge somebody. Right. That is correct. Okay. So and, imagine, you know, there are, uh, and as our healthcare system has morphed, this has long been an effort to keep people out of the hospital mm -hmm. in a cost recovery for pre-hospital providers who are providing a service that is completely based upon the logic that you have to transport the patient to the hospital to mm -hmm. receive any reimbursement. Mm -hmm. And as our pre-hospital medical system has expanded through the use of advanced providers, and so now we have paramedics delivering pre-hospital care that no longer either require the patient to go to the hospital or um, or, the, or the, the, the protocols require that we don't transport the patient to the hospital after we've spent a thousand or more dollars worth of our equipment. Those are the calls that allow us then to reimburse for our, to be, to bill for the services we provide. So it's not every patient. It probably will be less than 50 patients a year. But now through the protocol changes, there are a few calls a year where we spend a lot of money on equipment to treat that patient, but never transport that patient to the hospital. And this is now a new cost recovery that's been approved by the legislature. Um, and so we're new because we're ahead of the curve. It was, uh, Wilson adopted it last month in their fee structure. 
I suspect every agency in Chittenden County within the next year, once they work through their rate adjustments, will add it in as a cost recovery. Um, and so I would say it's what the, the national programs have all been advocating for the last decade um, is to try to keep people out of the hospital, but allow uh, providers to then do cost recovery or at least mm -hmm. attempt some level of cost recovery for our the services we provide. The system has just never allowed us to bill for those until now. Could we um, possibly just pull that one item off of the proposal and changes in the fees and, and vote on the rest of them, the, the transport fee cr increases, and put that on the back burner until we've had a chance to look at it closer? I think you can do. Yes, you can do that. Yeah, we, we do be. So I don't know if the council. I I glad, glad to hear what your explanation. I, I guess I, I guess I'm curious. Hear your explanation, but I, I I still need more information on it. I'm just not comfortable voting on that. To, that one portion of that that was. One more quick question about it. If these fees are charged to somebody who has not been transported, um, do you know if those fees are recoverable through their insurance or would so, they be yeah so we those? build this is us billing medicare primarily so first 80 percent of the patients we transport or care for are medicaid or medicaid medicare or medicaid only about 20 percent have private insurance so the most of our patients are billed through those two services that have caps on their reimbursement um, and so those are where we're really getting this money from and we balance bill for non-medicare medicaid um, but there's no collection agency so then so most and most of that is written off most of that is not reimbursed through insurance company, is written off after 120 days. So this is a reimbursement a project for our city, which is covered by most it, of the medical insurance. It is now covered by Medicaid and Medicare. That makes me much more comfortable with voting for it. And if I, if I can just add one more sentence to what the chief said, um, at the Green Mountain Care Board Oliver Wyman presentation last week, whatever that was, um, one of the things the consultant highlighted was, and kind of to your point about um, primary care and self-care, getting that care to the lowest level, the least intrusive level, keeping people at home longest, that's what's ultimately going to help bring down the cost of um, our healthcare system overall. Uh, so I think this was the chief and the fire department really looking at a new innovative way to help, help us as a system work in that direction in a structural way. And again, these aren't the patient we go to for a lift assist or the patient we go to to put back in the bed. It's the patients that we spend a lot of resources on that, that sometimes succumb and never to get transported to the hospital, or um, we, we push some sort of medication then suddenly makes them feel better um, and they don't have to go to the hospital weekend. We talk with medical control, they say, yeah, there's no need to bring them in, have them follow up with their, with their primary care. That saves the system a lot of money. Um, and that's this, but, but up until today, or until this is implemented, there's no way for us to bill the insurance company for that cost. So I'm perfectly comfortable with the transport increase fees. So I'm still not comfortable with this until I, I've had more chance to another chance to go talk about it with some people. Go ahead. Yeah, if I can um, just add to that, I I support this with the responses we've gotten from city staff. Um, I do think the notion of kind of bringing care where it's needed most is. The, the real issue is keeping people out of the ER because that's where you, the insurance providers and uh, the healthcare system is most taxed by when you enter the emergency room environment. So I guess my question, Tim, is if you want to pull this off, what additional information are you requesting specifically from Steve to get comfortable with that that charge that I, is reimbursable? Yeah, right? so I have about three calls that I went out, that went out today uh, that I made that I'm waiting to hear back from people. So I, I'm I'm glad to, to approve the other the transport fee increases, um, but uh, I'd like just to to pull this one out and we can vote on another time, maybe even the next we, meeting. We need to come come back next meeting on this on, on the whole section. No, or? no, on this one item. Yes, in two weeks. I, I'd love to if we if that okay. Two weeks is okay with me. I don't want a prolonged. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I don't. I don't, I don't either. I don't either. I just need a few more days to okay. make some more calls. Okay. So is everybody amenable that. So we're just gonna. So item. F will not contain that last item, which has a non-transport treatment fee. Specifically with it coming forward on the next meeting. Yes. 
And Steve, Chief, administratively, is it I to change the rates for half of all of them but one and then go back? Is I, there I would prefer to hold, pull the whole okay. issue for two weeks and bring it back as one new resolution. Okay, okay, okay. So August 19th. So we're going to pull item F. So we've resolved uh, item C, except that Mike is going to recuse. Um, can I have a motion to accept the consent agenda or so, approve it? So what, what you need to do is pull item C off the agenda? It's yeah. F. Or, okay. well, C. Ambulance fees, right? Well, you need to, I thought, so yes, you need to pull F off yeah. and you need to pull C off. You need to vote okay. on the one that has all the vote, oh. has everyone voting, yep. and then vote on the other, or table one and then vote on the other one. Okay. I so move, I ahead. move to pull F and C off the consent agenda and vote for the approval of the rest. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Mike, do you have a, what, are you voting or are you raising your hand? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 I'm, aye. Ready to get, uh, I'm ready to be voting. Thank There's you. a little delay here. <laughs> and that was an aye? You, yeah. You, okay. So it's unanimous. Good. Thank yes, you. Yes. I'm ready to. Now for item C. I move to um, approve, item C. approve item, item C and to continue item, item F until August 19th. Second. So, sorry. Okay. Sorry to those together. Into, just make a motion on C. Yeah. Okay. Just do C by yeah. itself. Yeah. You're going to have to do a roll call vote because we have a right. person yeah. remote. Yeah. And then do F separately. Okay. Thank you. Um, I move to approve uh, C. Um, yes, to approve C. The notice of conveyance for the Wheeler Park, Park Conservation Easement. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. No, you got to do a roll call. Uh, Sorry. Uh, oh, well, do we have to roll call even just the person on remote, right? Nope. Every single to. one? Mm -hmm. Laurie Smith. Aye. Tim Merritt. Aye. Andrew Chalnick. Aye. Elizabeth Fitzgerald. Aye. Mike Scanlon. Lose myself. Recuse. What do you say? Recuse. Recuse. Okay, thank you. Recuse myself for the... Uh, for the grounds I stated. You say, je recuse. <laughs> C'est oui. sounds like something else, but it's not, right? <laughs> okay. And I move to continue item F to the August 19th agenda. Second. We have motion and second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 And it is unanimous. No. I'm going to say no on oh, that. You said, you said no? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. All right. So, do we want a roll call on that? Yep. Okay, Lori Smith? Aye. Tim Barrett? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Elizabeth? Nay. Nay. Mike? Aye. Okay, Dave, thank you very much. Thank you for the process. Okay. Wow. It took a little while, but we got through. <laughs> so, thank you for your patience, everybody. Um, item 7, public hearing warned for 7 p.m. Ooh, we're 40 minutes late. <laughs> Hold a 24th reading, I'm sorry, 4th reading <laughs> at a public hearing of a drinking water ordinance. I'm thirsty myself. Update, David Wheeler, water resources engineer. I, I just did, yeah. Sorry, I do that earlier. Dave Wheeler, water resources engineer. And yes, hopefully we will not go to a 24th reading. Apologize, just pulling up my screen here. <clears throat> All right, so yeah, tonight we'll, we will be talking about the updates to the water ordinance first, and then we'll talk about updates to the uh, sanitary sewer and stormwater ordinance. Um, so just to kind of set the timeline here uh, for the water ordinance, we first presented the updates to the water ordinance back in April. And, you know, there's a bunch of just kind of modernization type edits uh, proposed to that language. It had been 20 years since we first updated it. Uh, we came back in May um, to provide the same updates uh, at a, an additional hearing. Um, council asked for some time to kind of, you know, better understand all the various edits being made. And then we had the first public hearing on July 15th. Um, prior to July 15th, we heard some feedback um, from, from residents on water meters being installed for the purpose of wastewater. And we reconsidered, um, there was language in the water ordinance to deal with sewer billing. 
and we propose to strike that language. So we made that recommendation at the July 15th public hearing. Um, so now the, the language has that section removed and we, we're having a, an additional public hearing on all of the previous updates, less that section about uh, sewer billing. There are no additional updates beyond that today. Does that all make sense? Does anybody have any questions which hearing we're at now? Could, could I just clarify? So there's been one public hearing held July 15th. Correct. And some changes were made at that hearing. Yes. Thank you. And so at this public hearing, you could adopt all the changes and then the water or ordinance will go into effect. We did not open the public hearing. The public hearing will come at the at end, the of, end the of the presentation. Okay, yeah. Yeah, sorry. So I'll give a brief presentation. You've heard it. Thank this you. This will be the fourth time, so we'll try and breeze Please through it. Please go ahead. Um, so the significant changes are listed here. Um, you'll see them on the following slides. Uh, a big part of the, the ordinance is establishing the water service area, as you've previously heard. So new buildings will be required to connect to municipal water within the water service area unless exempt and no new connections will be allowed outside of the mapped service area. And this establishes a clear boundary uh, for compliance with Act 47. We have also included language um, establishing a booster pump policy. The idea behind this is we want water to be provided by gravity and not rely on power. So in emergency situations, we don't need generators to provide water. Uh, water meter policy. So we've clarified that the cost of insulation is paid by the property owner, but then the city will take over the ownership of the meters. We're also moving to an automatic meter reading system. We're nearly complete with that, but we're adding a fee uh, for cases where um, conversion has not occurred to, to you know collect revenue for the manual meter reading. Um, we've adopted uh, standards for water meter sizes based off of their use. We've added language for temporary meters during construction. And again, we've struck the language discussing sanitary sewer billing in that all that language will live in the sewer ordinance, which you'll hear next. We have also established the city center service area and added a map with a reserved capacity of a uh, quarter million gallons per day. And this was important for establishing a reserve capacity necessary for the new town center designation. And as previously mentioned, um, you know, if there's a need for more than this amount, then, then um, there is certainly capacity of, available currently. We've also made a simple update to our rate and fee structure. So these, these numbers are just um, standardized across all other ordinances. Uh, updated rates and fees. So we clarified the definition, definition of the allocation fee. We've added in a base rate. So currently billing is done based off of usage fee only. We've given council the option to add a base rate but that will be set at $0 uh, from the start. So you could always go back and, and adjust that. And then we've also given you the authority to adjust the minimum water use quantity. So it's currently set at 1,000 cubic feet. And 41% and of customers use less than 1,000 cubic feet of water. So you could adjust that down if you desired. All right, so the next steps for the water ordinance. So we recommend that you open a public hearing, you take feedback, and then close the public hearing, and then have discussion. And if there are no changes to be made, um, you could you could adopt the, the ordinance. And, um, and I, I don't know if Colin has any... Uh, <laughs> All right, perfect. <laughs> I move to open the public hearing and waive the formal reading of the duly warned proposed amendment to the city's water ordinance pursuant to 24 ABSA Chapter 13, Section 106. Second. 
We have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? I can't see if Mike's raising his hand. Just if you He's have not. Is that okay? Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Does that have to be roll call? Did Mike? No, if it's unanimous, Aye. it does not. Okay, just wanted to. Okay. Yeah, so I guess it's unanimous. Okay. So we're now in a public hearing. Is there any feedback from the public on this online or in the room? Anybody in the house want to come up and give some testimony? No? Anybody online? Uh, yes, Jack Darling. So there, there is a caller online. A caller, okay. Uh, Jack Huron, is that what you said? Yes, he's. I'm online. Awesome. I'm currently on the phone and the computer, but uh, my computer voice wasn't working, so I had to go to the phone. And, Jack, um, I have a question, um, Jack. Repeat on the water. Did, did you catch his last name again? Huron. Darling. Oh, darling. D a r l a n g. Could you spell your last name? D a r. Go ahead. D a r l i n g. Darling. Okay. Go ahead, Jack. Yeah. So my question is about booster pumps uh, for the water and why why it's being restricted and why 35 pounds. I live over off Dorset Park, and uh, the water pressure here is horrendous um, for the shower taking and filling up your washing machine. And to not be allowed to have a booster pump, I don't have one currently, but I would like to have one because the water pressure, in my opinion, stinks. So I guess I would wonder why you're doing 35 pounds of pressure as your so-called rate um, when every other town that I work in, that I have buildings in, the water pressure is not nearly this low. Yeah, so the idea there, um, the water is provided by the tanks and when the water level is um, at the, the lowest operating point, um, I believe the area you're describing is kind of right on that cusp. And so we're, we're trying to prevent, um, you know, additional, at least with, I should go back to, sorry, the water service area map. We've excluded areas um, that can't achieve that 35 PSI from the water service area um, to prevent mm -hmm. new homes with low pressure. Um, now, I mean, if you, if you dig into the language, um, the third bullet here, individual booster pump stations are prohibited without written approval by Vermont DEC. So there's still, you know, a process for individual booster pumps. Um, but there have been issues with, I think, neighborhood scale booster pumps and um, having the city taking over those booster pumps and then being required to put in generators after the fact. So we're trying to avoid that liability specifically. And um, Jay, I don't know if you want to speak to that in any more detail. Are these booster pumps usually for neighborhoods or for individual homes? Homes. The 35 PSI level, I'm sorry, Jay Nato, water superintendent. The 35 PSI level that is established in this ordinance is taken verbatim from the Vermont Water Supply Rule, which covers all community water systems. We didn't just make up or pick a number of 35. 35 is the standard operating level, minimum operating level under normal conditions. Does not include fire flow conditions, but uh, under normal conditions. We have established a hydraulic gradient um, approximately 430 feet in the city, and that provides 35 PSI to the first floor elevations of homes at that level. So uh, the gentleman that's online that mentioned uh, water pressures in other communities, it's all about location. But why It is, and, and my point is, is the water pressure is not good you're going after to provide a minimum water pressure. This is the great water treatment center of Vermont that you guys say get all sorts of awards. And of all the towns I, I do stuff in, this one has the worst pressure. And, and by the way, most houses being built right now have two floors. So try to take a shower when you're getting at those low water pressures, you know, without a booster pump, it just ain't gonna happen. 
And I really don't think that that's what my tax paying dollars and whatnot should be being used for. If you're only going to supply 35 pounds of pressure. I have a quick question. on You this. have a lot of homes being built with a lot of people. It's been going on for more than 10 years and you guys haven't done anything about it. You have a water tower just up the road from me. I should have plenty of water pressure at my house, but you guys are holding the valves back to create, to not allow us to have the full pressure of the water tower. Because you want to hold to a minimum? What? I mean, this is ridiculous. And and you want to take away booster pumps so anybody even... Good luck watering your lawn. You can't even get more than one sprinkler to run. And if you turn on the faucet, it doesn't even run. So do I understand... And that's at 45 pounds of pressure. Do I which is what I have. Do I understand that with this um, ordinance, an individual homeowner can apply for a booster pump for their individual residence. Is that correct? And how onerous is that process? That is correct. And again, it's straight from the Vermont Water Supply Rule. If a homeowner would like to install an individual home booster, uh, water booster pump station, they can apply um, through the application and design review process with the drinking water division. And upon approval by drinking water, the state would, or the city, after review, would pretty much adopt the same thing. And by keeping it to an individual homeowner, it prevents the city from having to put in generators for a community booster pump, et cetera. And that's the purpose for this. Is that correct? That's correct. And it, is it also true that there could be some homeowners that homeowners that uh, it's purely subjective that one home or if it's in Dorset Park and if it's in the uh, the condo area, one particular condo could have lower pressure than another one because of something else that's going on besides the the city water pressure where it's delivered to the to the, the building is correct. That is also correct. Yeah. So we can't we can't tell from this conversation what that individual problem is, but. But Jack Darling, you do have the opportunity to apply to uh, to to the VT, Vermont DEC to uh, install your own booster pump. Is there anybody else? Vermont DEC, do, 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 do like the state of Vermont. Vermont. The pressure, or is that just the pressure the tanks deliver? Do we throttle the valves to reduce pressure? That's the pressure that the tanks deliver. No, our, our valves are full open. Full open. Okay, thank you is what it is based on either pumps from uh, valves are full open. Uh, the system pressures are based on where the uh, locations or taps are located in relation to the tanks, the water system. level, and also CWD production. Is there anybody else online? Yeah, can you hear me? Doyle is also on mute. Yes. Who's calling? Who's speaking, please? Ryan Doyle. Is it too dark in here? Ah, there we are. Um, Ryan Doyle, uh, my question about the map is how exactly are the determinations made about the siting of that map? Because I see some places have larger areas away from the road than others, and some places have gaps in between houses where it's not provided like uh around the golf uh golf course for example so can somebody explain how all of that gets figured out yeah so they basically took all the natural resource areas and you know areas where development is not going to be allowed and excluded those areas from the water service area and then additionally removed any land above 430 feet in elevation or we can't provide that 35 psi when the tanks are at the low level so it's a combination of those things. Does that mean that the golf course uh, doesn't irrigate the lawns there as well? So the golf course, they irrigate out of a um, pond, a series of stormwater ponds throughout the site or mm -hmm. kind of natural ponds. They have a pump in one of them that feeds the other ponds. And there's even a well in one of the ponds. So if that pond level gets low, they can replenish. Um, we're working with them on a stormwater project. So we, we understand their whole irrigation system. Gotcha. So there is no, no water service connected in there at all. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Anybody else? Otherwise, we're going to close the public hearing. Oh, in the far back, 
Come, please come on down. And identify yourself. Hi, Christina Griffin. Oh, you got to turn on your mic. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Hi, Christina Griffin. I was wondering if the gentleman could speak to the homes that are at Vermont National and the fact that they are both above the level of the um, of the water tower as well as the situation with the pumps being sort of like a hybrid private public situation. Uh, could you clarify the question? Is it the same question that was asked before, essentially, or? A... Uh, similar, although it's similar, although it's a, although there seem to be varying water pressure issues in the neighborhood. Well, where's uh, your neighborhood? Uh, uh, it's Vermont National, so Golf Course Road. G golf Course Road. Yeah. Okay. Jay, are you aware of Golf Course Road? The Vermont National Country Club area, including Golf Course Road, is one of two area, two neighborhoods in the city that is served by booster pump stations, uh, large booster pump stations. The VNCC pump station is located next to the uh, um, clubhouse and pool area. It does serve that area. Fluctuating pressures are the results of demands and pump action from that pump station. They're not attributed to anything that's happening in the city's distribution system. And those pumps are owned by Champlain Water District? Those pumps are actually owned by the HOA for VNCC. Oh, oh okay. And are they maintained by the HOA? Um, we do routine, or the South Burlington Water Department uh, through CWD performs routine maintenance, and be maintenance beyond that is paid for by the VNCC. Okay. And, and are they grandfathered in? Is that why, or will they yes, be impacted by they are, they're established, they are grandfathered in. Yeah, if you stand on Golf Rush Road and you look over, the, you're kind of above the, the base of the tank. You, yeah. <laughs> so that's a real necessity. Yep. Yeah. I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Anybody else? Mr. Scanlon. Yeah, I have a, a question that just popped to mind. Um, the, I'm just curious in terms of the, the operational costs uh, for the, this ordinance change. Well, what is the impact in terms of it creates greater efficiencies for the city? Does it bring uh, greater sort of margins of of economic benefit in terms of maintenance operation. Uh, you and emphasize the new fee structures in terms of, uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not fee structures, but penalty structures, which hopefully are a, a more sort of deterrent. I was just wondering what is the net, one question is what is the net sort of operating impact uh, for the city's budget? And the second question, uh, I'm just looking at the, the water service area slide. It says establish clear interpretations for Vermont Act 47. Um, is there sort of a, you know, before and after um, calculation of housing possibilities uh, it creates or, or, or changes or there is no net change? Uh, you know, Paul Connor was very kind to uh, share a uh, sort of interactive map. But to be quite honest, it, it, it makes it sort of hard to deduce, you know, it, you know what is the net impact or, or of of what would be possible, of course, so it's up to who chooses to build, develop, but I was just thinking in terms of what would be allowed. Yeah, so I'll let, uh, it look like Tom wants to talk about the overall kind of financial impact of this, but by establishing a base rate, you know, that would allow us to generate a lot of revenue uh, for maintenance purposes. Um, but Tom, if you wanna elaborate and provide your thoughts. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, Tom DiPietro, Director of Public Works, joining you all remotely this evening for a few topics. Um, to answer um, Mr. Scanlon's question, so th this is not going to have a huge impact economically on our water division. Uh, as we've said in a couple of times, I think it might have got lost because we've been here so many times now. We're getting in the weeds a bit. Um, this is just to update our 20-year-old language, clarify existing policies, and establish that service area map that uh, we are required. Um, and I think I see Paul at the table there, so I'm going to leave off getting further into the map, Paul, if you want to take that piece of it. 
Sure. Paul Connor, Director of Planning and Zoning. So uh, the map, if you can bring that slide back up, um, the map is really um, a a reflection of largely the city's existing land use policy now translated into also water and in a couple of weeks time sewer mapping. So this reflects the zoning uh, districts that have um, enabled housing largely previously and is um, as we'll talk in about in a couple of weeks, uh, largely unchanged um, reflecting the city policy. To your specific question of how much is going to change in housing, I would say the service area won't change that discussion much at all. Act 47 and Act 181 will have a substantial long-term Im implication because, for example, under Act 181, all areas of the state that are enabled by local zoning to have housing a uh, multi-unit building of up to four dwelling units in the building must be permitted on the same size lot as a lot that has a single unit. So in concept, any uh, any residential lot essentially in the city that has a single family home on it could become a fourplex. Um, so that as enacted under the state um, changes of Act 47 and Act 181 could have a long-term substantial impact in the city. The what you see in the purple there is really a reflection of what is already either existing as neighborhoods or enabled as um, neighborhoods or um, in this in this case this is is not distinguishing between housing and commercial areas but the the essentially the areas enabling development versus enabling uh, and promoting conservation that is already the city policy uh, thank you, Tom and Paul. I, I think those are very important macro points to make to be sure everyone's clear. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Going once, going more question slash comment. Um, I'm in favor of, of adopting this, um, but I would like to have us revisit at some point in the not too distant future the uh, minimum, the thousand cubic foot minimum. We have 41% 41, 41 of the population that's using less than 41%, which means that those 41% uh, are not incentivized to conserve their water consumption. So I would like to see the, the minimum uh, cubic footage rate at a, at a level that incentivizes the majority of our population to consider conserving. And we can do that in the future. So, and we can do that in the future. I just would like to see that be something that sure. come forward so that it doesn't just stay where it is. Because um, I think that's an important thing for our, our water district. And that's not just the only issue. I have a separate issue, but Good. it's not for tonight. Okay. All right. So I'm ready to close the public hearing if everybody else is. So I move to close the public hearing of proposed amendments as warned to the City of South Burlington's Water Ordinance pursuant to 24 AVSA Chapter 13, Section 106. Second. second that. I have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Aye. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to move to item eight, which is potential action. <laughs> Should we approve this drinking water ordinance after the 34th hearing of it? Or can we have a motion? I move to adopt the amended water ordinance as warrant pursuant to 24 ABSA chapter 13, section 107. I second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? Um, could I ask a question? I think some of, I think the, um, well, first well, first question is, is there a requirement to have three public hearings? So there's no requirement. Um, some of the um, questions I've had as a newer counselor have been in response to the fact that one of the driving factors was uh, modifying the ordinance to comply with Act 47. So it's been, it has been difficult for me to reconcile what um, having the map, was, it, was that a restriction? Because it, it's confusing when you read no new connections, but it says outside the map service area. So it it came across initially as a restrictive um, ordinance, and 
then as I've started to listen to the public hearings uh, with the Planning Commission on LDRs, that's where I really see, I think as Paul, you've indicated, the opportunities for um, enhanced housing opportunities within the city. And the the fundamental question I have is there's, it, at which I think you, you can answer, is that there's nothing about the map that restricts what may come in front of council from the Planning Commission regarding the revised LDRs. Is that an accurate statement? The map that you see for the um, proposed water service area and sewer service area aligns with what you're going to see from the Planning Commission. The one exception being, as uh, Dave spoke to, areas above, above 430 feet of elevation um, the zoning would still allow housing in there. It just would not be able to be municipally water served because of the uh, the water pressure. The Planning Commission and staff did not feel that that was a reason to prohibit residential development because wells are acceptable. But otherwise, the maps that you will see from the Planning Commission align with the mapping in here. Yeah. And so with that clarification, I feel comfortable supporting that. Great. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Whoa, wait. I just saw a flash in front of my eyes here. Michael. Yeah, I just small, small question. I And looking at the map on the city center, there's that little, it's, I'm just curiosity, more curiosity, but it's just uh, struck me as odd, is that there's this little section between San Remo and Dorset, which is not part of the city center. I, I'm sure that's a very simple question, explanation. Yes. Paul? Uh, the answer to that question is, uh, under state law, we are limited to no more than 175 acres to be in our new town center designation. Okay. When we added the UMAL property, we had to find a way to be under 175 acres, so we're 174 point something acres, and these were two properties gotcha. that we identified as unlikely to see redevelopment because they're relatively new parcels. Newly built. Okay, parcels. perfect. Thank you. Yes, it is. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Paul. You ready for the vote? Mm -hmm. okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you very much. You passed an ordinance, you guys. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now moving With on great to speed. <laughs> another public hearing. <clears throat> uh, this is agenda item nine, which is uh, uh, hold a second public Second reading and public hearing uh, on an update to the sanitary sewer and stormwater ordinance. And Dave Wheeler again. All right. Yep. Dave Wheeler. Marissa. Marissa, please. Would you like to join, Dave? Because you're on here. As it's, yeah. You're on, you're on stage. Yeah. You can come on up. Um, all right. So this one, we will not be, well, you can pass it tonight, but we are going to recommend making some additional changes. And so this is a public hearing, um, but we will, we're going to be requesting a second public hearing on August 19th. So sanitary sewer ordinance, um, you know, establishes regulations for the management operation and maintenance of our municipal sewer system. And it has been relatively recently updated, but we have some additional updates to it, uh, particularly to comply with Act 47. We previously, uh, presented to you on those updates on June 17th. And, you know, one big picture thing is we are, we're separating the sanitary sewer ordinance from the stormwater ordinance. So they, they were developed with the sanitary sewer ordinance first, then the stormwater ordinance kind of as a part of that same ordinance. In the future, they will live as separate ordinances. So, you see the last bullet in red after we got some some feedback um, from the public uh, we we currently bill for sewer in in a couple different ways we either do it through water metering or you know one example queen city park we do it on a per bedroom basis and so we actually we met with the folks down in queen, queen city park uh, we we toured some of the houses and, and their construction and we we want to put the alternative billing method into our city ordinance. Uh, that way we are following our ordinance and not billing folks based off of just a past agreement. So the significant changes to the sewer ordinance, 
the sewer service area, updates to billing, um, updated allocation requirements. We added references to the DPW standards and separating out the stormwater and sewer. So similar to the water service area, the uh, sewer service area, it, it simply includes those elevations above 430 feet because those can be provided sewer service by gravity. Uh, meters for wastewater only customers. So as I was previously getting into, um, the existing ordinance requires that a meter be installed for wastewater only customers. So if you're on a private water system, you have to install, um, you still have to install a water meter. So that way we can bill you for wastewater purposes. And we don't charge for drinking water. That's, you know, it's on a private system. Um, and again, in, in Queen City Park in particular, you know, there's some homes that were built on slabs or with a crawl space. So there's no area in the basement to install a water meter. And we're not going to force them to put a water meter in their living room. Um, additionally, some of the houses were built on property lines or near other buildings. So there may, might not be space for an exterior uh, meter vault. So on a case-by-case -case basis, we would like to be able to allow folks to continue um, under the current agreement um, and just put that into the, the ordinance. And I have language at the end here that shows what that, um, that al alternative billing method is. Um, yeah, here we go. <laughs> so when installation of a water meter is deemed prohibitive, the annual charges will be based on a per bedroom rate where the first bedroom will be charged the minimum fee and then each additional bedroom will be charged 75% of the minimum fee plus any base rate. And again, that's just based off of what we are currently charging folks. I have a question about this. Is now the time or should I wait till you're done with Now is fine, yeah. Okay. Um, specifically for Queen City Park because yep. that's where this mostly comes into play. Um, the way I read this, anybody that has a location where it's easy to add a water meter, they must add a water meter. Correct. Um, one of the things we talked about in the past was if there's a water meter, that may help uh, drive conservation. Um, there's a minimum water fee uh, for water meters, I guess the thousand cubic feet. That'll apply to to the Senate to the to the uh, sewer fee as well, correct? Um, I believe so. So, uh, Queen City Park is operating at significantly below the standard uh, water levels. So, installing meters will be a expensive project for homeowners there, and it's very likely that they will not see a reduction in their water or their sewer bills. So I'm just wondering how that gets balanced. And then those that don't put it in um, are basically being built at the same rate they're being built now. So yeah, so if you have more than one bedroom, you know, you're being billed a multiple of the minimum yeah. fee. And so you will have a payback period, absolutely. Okay. So the more bedrooms you have, the quicker that payback period, because you're paying a higher sewer fee currently. Okay. So, uh, similar to the water... Did you actually... Uh, Mike, did you, did you have a question? Mike, Mike, Mike. Yeah, I just... I wonder if you could just... I'm just having a harder time understanding that, uh, the payback sentiment, because I think as... You know, I fully subscribe what uh, Lori was saying in the last session about uh, getting to a point where people are actually being billed for their water use uh, in terms of the baseline. Um, but as I understood it, you will be billed if you don't have a meter per bedroom for, for sewage, regardless of whether those bedrooms are occupied. Uh, I, I am aware that, you know, there are people here who would like to downsize. Uh, I'm aware of one particular woman whose, you know, husband has passed, children have moved out of state, 
would like to downsize to a, a smaller house but cannot. I'm not sure if it falls into this particular situation, but I was just thinking she is then paying based on the bedrooms, regardless uh, of the, the actual sewage usage. Yes, we, we're not proposing any changes to the current agreement. Um, we're just kind of putting it into the ordinance the way it was previously structured. Uh, we're just providing- so this is the current? Yeah, this is how folks are- I'm sorry to interrupt you. This is current basically ability. you're just codifying something that has been in practice for some time. So that way we're in compliance with the city ordinance and we're not doing something that's not written. But conceptually, this person may be paying more than, in theory, the sewage services they'd be using. That's correct. And so they could opt to put in a meter if it's feasible, and that bill would come down, and there would be a payback period as well. So we don't know the specifics of this one resident, but if, if it's feasible to install a meter, then that would likely pay back over time. Is it possible there could be some technology in the future that would be able to, to meter without having to cut into the line and, and, and do a through meter? Is there something that's out there in the future that you attach to a, a, a supply line and it gives you a relatively good measure of, of usage? I'm just curious. Honestly, I, I doubt it, um, but I could be wrong. I, 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 yeah. Okay. At the, at the higher levels, yes. We have wastewater metering throughout. It's very expensive. So, so it's Bob, but, our counselor online yeah. can't hear you if you're not yeah. the mic. Come to the mic. To the mic, Mike. Sorry, I didn't need to be added. But um, yes, I mean we use we have wastewater meters throughout. You know, well, I don't at, mean waste. I mean at I mean, the large levels. I mean water. You know, regular water usage. So you could use the same inductive meters and whatnot. But at that small, it would be very cost prohibitive. Oh, it would be owner. very costly. Very. Oh. Those are extremely expensive meters compared to a, a standard propeller meter. Interesting. Okay. I was just curious, you know. I mean, I was thinking there was something out there that would just snap onto a pipe and give you a close to an accurate reading, you know, for... There is at the, the higher levels. I can't say on a, like, a, yeah. it, it, that small of a service line, but certainly on a six-inch line, there's, or some, there is, but they, they are very expensive because we you. have many of them. Thank you. So you have more slides? Yes. Okay. Uh, so yeah, establishing a base rate similar to the water ordinance. Um, so similarly, it would start at zero dollars and you could adjust that as you see fit. Uh, billing is currently done on usage fee only. However, uh, through a rate study that was completed, it is not recommended to establish this base rate without addressing the intermunicipal agreement with Colchester as they are a single customer. Um, we also adopted a, or proposing a um, city service, city center service area that's identical to the other one from the water ordinance with a reserve capacity of 150,000 gallons per day. And this helps us to establish the new town center designation. Uh, for allocation requirements, we've streamlined how allocation fees are paid uh, to reduce paperwork. Projects under 1,000 gallons per day are only required to apply for final allocation. We clarified allocation fee versus connection fee, added an allocation fee definition, removed references to sewer permits. Um, we specified situations where properties or lots are vacant. The allocation returns to zero after three years and also clarify that allocations run with the land and not the owner. So you can't buy up land and take their allocation. Hmm. Then there's miscellaneous administrative updates. Uh, again, separating out stormwater and sewer, adding references to DPW standards, updating, updating job titles and other language, um, and then updating our civil penalties and waiver fees. Uh, there will be future updates, so we're undertaking an, an industrial user survey right now to better understand the industrial wastes that are coming to our treatment plant. And based off of that information that we collect, we'll be establishing policies to deal with that. Uh, we're going to kick it over to Stormwater now, so any more sewer questions? Right. No mic 
questions? Oh, someone's got their oh, hand up. Like me, Doug. Well, do we want to wait till the public hearing opens before we take his question? It's up to you. Michael, can you wait until we open the hearing? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Marisa Rorba, Stormwater Superintendent. Um, I'm here to talk about the updates we're making to the Stormwater Ordinance. Um, I've already basically given you this presentation once. We are not proposing any additional changes from the last time you heard this. Um, we are... Sorry, go ahead. The significant changes, we are dividing out the definitions because we are dividing the stormwater and sewer into separate sections. We are adding the independent enforcement and fee sections. And then we are, the biggest thing is we are changing the fee basis calculation as that was changed by state law on May 30th of this year. Um, we are actually in the process or starting that process in conjunction with several of our fellow municipalities in the area. Uh, and we also updated some references to current state laws and updated minor language to reflect the new 2023 MS4 permit. All right, so next steps for the sanitary sewer and stormwater ordinance. So it is a public hearing tonight, so you can, um, you can open the public hearing, take feedback, and then um, close the public hearing uh, again, we would we would propose that council make changes, and I've got them drafted out here, to the proposed sanitary sewer ordinance, and then um, have a, an additional public hearing on August 19th. Okay. Is that it? Okay, so... Do we need a motion? I move to open the public hearing and waive the formal reading of the duly warned proposed amendments to the city's sanitary sewer and storm water ordinance pursuant to 24 VSA, Chapter 13, Section 106. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 It is unanimous. Aye. The hearing is now open. Is there any public feedback on this proposed ordinance change? Anybody in the audience? Nobody's raising their hand here. Now Michael Matag has got his hand raised. Hi, Michael. Yeah, uh, I had a question on <clears throat> billing for wastewater, which I understand is based on how much water you use. Then the the wastewater charge is um, a factor that's uh, derived from how much uh, water you use. So I was wondering if it's equitable. If let's say. Um, the homeowner uses 60% of the water that is needed um, for watering his garden or filling his swimming pool, which creates no waste wastewater at all, but his wastewater charge is based on the total amount of water he's used. Uh, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so there's actually a whole section in our ordinance that addresses pool filling. So if you're going to fill your pool, you can call us ahead of time and we'll come down and we'll basically deduct that usage from your bill. Okay, and what about just watering the garden or a vegetable garden, yes, something like so that, I using think, I think 50, that ends 50. Up, Right, that ends up being more of a de minimis quantity of water so that, um, you know, we're not going to come meter your your garden hose um, so that you'll just be charged the, the water use rate for that. You could presume. Irrespective of or you actually could get a water meter. The you could have a, a if yeah you're doing substantial irrigation you know um, more than just watering your flowers then you could have a, a separate meter but if we establish a base rate then you might end up paying you know a, a second base rate a good reason to have a rain barrel absolutely or to save all the spare water that you accumulate around your house that you would just throw down the drain you could use that to water that I know that my usage goes way up in the summer because of the yard and the gardens, and and that's just a fact of life. Yeah. If I were a farm, I might have a meter attached to a fire hydrant, right, which would not then generate any sewer charges. So, yeah. Sorry, Michael. Yeah. No. no most of my most of the uh, rainwater that I collect, uh, I have my downspouts go into French drains below the surface, so they don't, there's no surface runoff from um, 
rainwater that goes into the ground. So it doesn't affect me. You know, it's just that the, the metered the metered amount of water that I that I use might be um, the consumed the consumed water for drinking and cooking and all the rest of it, and maybe uh, only a fraction of the total in summer. But I think I might, my question has been answered, and I'll live with what I ha what we have. As will we all. Thank you. Anybody else? If there's nobody else, then I guess we'll move to close the public. I room. move to close. Wait, sorry, oh, oh, oh. I'm sorry. We Ryan Doyle somebody. appears to have just turned his camera on. <laughs> Ryan Doyle. Yeah. Hi, Ryan Doyle. Um, I asked this question previously about um, staff going out for these pool fill-ups. Um, and it seems sort of odd that we would give staff time towards an effort to save somebody money on very discretionary water usage, um, rather than looking at it like this is above and beyond for water usage. And because they have to be paying it out of the wastewater fee, it just seems weird to then allow staff time to be taken away from other things for that. Um, and I would be concerned about that language going forward for your consideration. Yeah, so the the language is existing, and it's my understanding that this does not take up staff time, um, a considerable amount of staff time. I think it's quite rare for anybody to actually be that familiar with the ordinance and call us up and go through that process. Is it a matter of just getting a meter reading before and after done? Yeah, I believe so. Right. So, but it's a so they're not standing there watching the pool. No, get it filled. I, I would hope not. So, yeah. Great. If I can, I interject sure, for a please. second. I do think these the, some of the questions that you all have asked tonight about uh, minimums and pools and deductions are, are really interesting questions. I would also it, it one it is on um, your policies and strategies to revisit the weight the rate study and think about those questions. So if you want to prioritize that this year, that's something we can do. Two, I just want to remind the council that you also serve as the. Um, Board of Water Commissioners, is that the official title? Um, you are fiduci fiduciarily responsible for the enterprise funds, that is the water fund, wastewater fund, and stormwater fund. So while we save costs somewhere, you're going to have to raise them somewhere else in right. order to maintain the operation. So it is a good question about where your policy values are, but it do it's not necessarily going to save the system money. It will increase costs somewhere else. Yep unless we really reduce our usage. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Is there anybody else? I, I move to close point. the public hearing of proposed amendments as warned to the City of South Burlington Sanitary Sewer and Stormwater Ordinance pursuant to 24A VSA Chapter 13, Section 106. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 And it's unanimous. Aye. So we're now at item 10, which is potential action, and you would like us to uh, can, to set up a a third reading, right, on the, at the next meeting? Yep, third reading, second public hearing okay. with these proposed changes. Do we have a motion? I move to consider further amendments to the city's sanitary sewer and stormwater ordinance, including changes proposed by staff to section 38-396 paragraphs B and C and calls all said amendments to be publicly warned and set for public hearing on August 19th at 7 p.m. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 It is unanimous. Aye. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank we'll you. We'll see you in two weeks. Can't wait. Um, well, I was just going to suggest that. So um, we're going to take a five-minute break right now, and then we'll be back. Thank you very much. So we are back in session with this uh, city council meeting at item number 11, which is um, discuss the intersection of Market Street and the Rick Marcotte Central School Access Road, hopefully soon to be named, uh, to ensure the needs and safety of all users uh, that they are met and provide direction to staff. This was a city council request. So, Erica. So, we're not, we prepared some background information. Um, this is a conversation that have been happening at the staff level for a couple of years, um, and counselors requested this be added. So, we provide some background information about what we've talked about and what options are, but we're not 
we're here to listen to what the community would like. I know Sue Connolly is here, Lissa McDonald is here online, the principal at Rick Marcotte, and also Jean Marie Clark, who is the new Jean Marie, sorry if I mess up your title, Director of Operations for the school district, I believe is the title. Um, so they are here remotely as well. Can I provide the background to the request? It was made by uh, Mike and I, and it uh, came out of a bunch of discussions that were had at the Safe Routes to School Task Force, and the um, task force uh, members really identified the one intersection of market, and I'll call it School Street for now, as um, an intersection that, um, would, let me just say, particularly problematic. Um, and Sue Conley could, sp could speak to it uh, better than I, who has kind of personal experience. But um, as relayed to the task force, there have been, you know, um, multiple situations where there was dangerous driving, uh, pedestrians, and or the crossing guard, you know, almost almost got hit. It's very difficult for the for the buses to turn. Um, that that intersection um, works much better actually when there's police presence there, that folks seem to obey the um, stop signs better, but that doesn't seem to be like a long-term solution to addressing the traffic issue to have constant police presence. So, you know, the question really was, um, is there some structural, some geometry or some other thing that can be done to relieve the pressure on that intersection and um, i'm not a traffic engineer um, my, mike may have his own thoughts but you know from my perspective um what what i would want the council consider is is whether we should hire you know some expert consultant to examine that intersection and let us know um what if anything can be done so that, that that's where it came from and if, if I may just add, I, I agree with everything that Andrew said. And I think uh, ultimately the, I, the reason we both came forward is because, you know, as you mentioned, uh, Jesse uh, and Erica, you know, there had been a lot of different staff discussions uh, and people shared the, their understanding of those different discussions. But when the question was raised, uh, at, you know, knowing that this was going to be an issue going forward, the question had been raised, had there ever been a study done, an assessment done, all of their alternatives that can be built in to ameliorate this issue uh, before all the buildings go up. And uh, at that point, there didn't seem to be a clear yes to that. So to Andrew's point, you know, is there still, you know, it's, it is an issue. Uh, it has played out, I think, as many people would have predicted. And the question is, is there benefit to uh, at this stage, given all that has been built up, still to try to explore alternative options if the uh, or mitigations to the the turn, whether it's the um, uh, the ability for the bus to go up a little bit over the the curb, uh, these amountable curbs, or, or something like that, is because it does seem like it is a problem or an accident waiting to happen. So if the council would like to direct us to hire an engineer to do that assessment, we certainly can. Can we hear from some of the folks who are online that may be able to provide some additional color? Tim's meeting, go for it. Uh, sure. Um, is there anybody on, Lisa, did you want to comment? You're muted. Here you go. What, what are, where are you? <laughs> are you in the, are you in an upside down boat? Oh, no sound. We still can't hear you. Melissa, you appear to be unmuted on uh, go to meeting. Is your if you hover over your mic button, is it select is it selecting maybe earbuds or your laptop otherwise? There's a little arrow next to the mic button. No, still can't hear you. The alternative is that you call as well. Lisa, I'll put the phone number that you could call in the chat. Maybe I will. Do you want to go on to somebody else? Well, in the meantime, I have 
question or, or thoughts that I just want to throw out. And it's, it's really clear that that intersection is a hazardous intersection, the way it's being operated now. Um, I know that in the write-up it talked about possibly using the entrance off of Williston Road as one possibility. There is also what is the extension of Mary Street, which is on the other side here. And in looking at this, I would hope that we would consider all three of those options, possibly having uh, inbound traffic going one way and outbound traffic going another way, or some, or east bound traffic going one way and westbound traffic going another is options for resolving this problem because it seems like all the traffic going um, in the current entrance is a pretty tough bottleneck so I just wanted to add that to the conversation one more option that might be considered is a dedicated uh, bus lane behind the new apartments that parallels Market Street I, th I think there's some room there I'm not sure but boy that's uh, an awful uh, difficult turn radius because I travel behind the city hall and turn mm -hmm. left onto the stub of Mary Street to come back to Dorset Street and that I'm talking about the other side the like other side behind the apartments oh but I think in the end of the day this is what I think yeah you know, as Andrew said you know is it would have would have been good perhaps in the past if not but does it still make sense to have a, a engineer can look through all the options and obviously they have to coordinate with the impact on the busing routes we heard that uh, in terms of the the number of buses and, and and the schedule they need to keep so i guess that is the all operative question you know how much would a study cost and is there value to it at this juncture if we decide to hire somebody it's going to take a long time right and what i want to know is is there a practical thing that we can do before school starts to help with the situation and make some people happy um, especially the, the school district. And, and that's a simple question I want to ask and want to hear from staff if they have some definite ideas. I mean, putting in the four-way stop sign was brilliant when it was finally done, right? Because it, it allowed you know, vehicles to actually get onto the, the road to the school, whereas before they, would, they didn't have a chance, right? And they would back up on Market Street, so. Uh, yeah, Erica Quallen, Deputy Director of Capital Projects for Public Works. So in your memo, we had laid out a bunch of different options of things that uh, we as uh, staff or um, and in conjunction with the school district look at. There are a few that based on your kind of short term ask that I would probably call out on here. Um, the one of them is the first one around reconfigure the bus routes, left turns in and left turns out of the current intersection uh, are totally fine to be made based on turning templates and that's not uh, a turn that we've heard about any concerns for. Uh, so left in and left out is definitely um, an option. Another one um, on here that's a bit uh, shorter term that could be done uh, is uh, if the school district is open to this, creating a drop-off location that's nearby um, and being able to walk the kids the kind of final stretch. Um, that would be, um, I mean, obviously that's up to the school district and the school to determine what they feel comfortable with, but that is a shorter term option that we had put uh, in here. Uh, we also in here mentioned moving the stop bars. It does make it a bit wonky in terms of the driver experience and when you move the stop bars really far back from the crosswalks people are gonna creep up anyway mm -hmm. so um, you would end up likely in the same kind of scenario where someone would have to go someone holds back so that the bus can go sorry sorry okay Hey, Lissa, if you, that worked, I think. That worked, we could hear you, um, but I think you need to now mute your go to meeting and then call back in and it won't do that go thing. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's fine. So those are really the ones that um, I think are kind of the shortest term, uh, low, if not zero cost options, but um, 
obviously conversations that need to be ha had uh, around impacts to the school so, and their so Erica, operations. I understand from the school that kind of left turn only is not really an option because it significantly increases the distances that the buses would then have to travel. And moving the curb, the you know, the line back, as you, you said, doesn't really help either because cars are going to really inch forward in any event. So, but that, but that, but that is a simple thing to do that could have an impact for a large percentage of, of cars that, that are at the intersection, right? Because that's the stop bar. That's where you're supposed to stop. Now, if there's no bus there, right, then if they creep, I don't care. But if there's a bus that's going to come around the corner and, and it's their turn to come, right? So then they're going to be, they're going to have to stay at that stop bar in order to, otherwise, I mean, I guess the question is, can somebody give me the stats that says that, through your phone so and turn her volume down she turned she uh, closed her left yeah lid. i that haven't way? tried to mm. is she still on the phone no she she's <laughs> hanging up oh. Lisa, if you can hear us turn the volume down on your laptop and mute yourself and call in and listen and participate in the meeting via the phone i don't know if she can hear us well, while we're waiting, I guess, can somebody give me some really good anecdotal evidence about how many cars have had to back up because the, the bus came around the corner and, and couldn't make it because the car was at the stop bar? I think there's someone in this room that yeah, probably can. There's the room. <laughs> is, is what? Sue is Sue here. Sue is the expert. Yeah. Oh. I think the challenge with this conversation is, and I would, I would love to hear from Sue or from Lissa, is... Um, so Erica is a traffic engineer and she's trying to provide you some options based on engineering. So she's giving you her pro professional recommendation. Those may not be palatable within the community for a variety of political reasons. Um, you all can direct us to do other things. Um, I think regardless of what solution we identify, it's going to require culture change for the drivers in these very particular windows of time at this intersection. So if it's moving stop bars, we, we're gonna need the school community to help cooperate on the education of that. Um, if it's uh, turning radiuses or left-hand turns, we're gonna need the school cult community to participate in that culture change. Or we can do, you know, bring in a different traffic engineer and provide you a different set of more expansive recommendations. It's hard for us to give you other recommendations other than that, that I don't think we're going to be able to implement by the time school starts. I have a question for Erica. Um, <laughs> my understanding is the real issue is half hour to 45 minutes at arrival and departure. Um, would having a traffic control person available for that period of time enable that? So if somebody was there as a traffic control person telling people where to stop and where to go, I don't know what the cost effectiveness is of that, but would that be a viable alternative? So, uh, Laurie, just for a little bit of history on that. So Sue is that person right now. Um, she volunteers she... in that role. The prior councils has allocated funding to the school district to pay for a professional in that role. Okay. The school district has, I mean, I don't. I'm talking a little over my skis at this point because it's not my organization, but my understanding is they've tried to recruit okay. somebody for that position. It's a very hard position to recruit for. So Sue has very generously offered to continue her volunteer service, but that's correct me if I'm wrong. I get it. Sorry? I said that is a huge stretch and a huge gift, um, but I didn't know if, if it was possible to actually get a traffic control person whose job it is. Um, and the council, the so, you, so the council we, has taken action to do that to allocate money okay. to do that, and just can't get it ha somebody. hasn't come to fruition okay. yet. Is there a way to move that forward? I'll so just throw that. it's on the school board at this yeah, point. Okay, that's not my organization. Okay. So the only short-term option is to move the stop bars for now. That's the simplest, cheapest thing that we can do, right? There were the other options that had been laid out also. Uh, so it would be uh, by direction of council in coordination with the school. 
board and school district around what can be done um, and we're happy to support if the stop bars were the choice support and figure out how much it needs to be moved we have some preliminary estimates or uh, coordination around um, other options we'd be happy to support that but it is um, your direction and school board's direction a, a new temporary <laughs> drop-off would seem to be would seem to be honestly work better if there were such a location so Jean Marie has her hand up and I believe now Lissa has called in what do we let I'm in I I'm, I'm sorry we're having a terrible thunderstorm here and I'm, I'm at my camp in Maine somebody asked where am I that's where I am and I'm in um my grandfather built a some cottages out of a barn that he torn down. So that's why it looks sort of like I'm in I'm in a barn actually. So um that, that's just a fun fact. Okay. Um I am hearing people talking about a temporary drop off location, which um is something that I um don't think my the school community will support that is our school driveway. We've always used that as our school driveway to drop off children at a different location than to have to walk to the school property. I, I really don't, I don't imagine our, um, our parents really supporting that. Um, but um, I, would, I would like to find a way for us during those heavy traffic hours just to get some, just to get some more help. Um, with getting the buses to be able to turn in and out of our driveway um, in a safe manner and in a way that um, is more convenient for all of the traffic that is, is, is passing through at that time. I think that maybe the, the um, moving the cross, moving the, um, the Mr. Poon's what we're calling that the Poon Drive, <laughs> um, so that we have an actual four corners um, that that would help um, as far as people's sight lines and making turns in and out of that part of the um, of mar um, turning off from Market Street in the opposite direction. Sometimes cars don't see. Um, that people are coming out of our school driveway. Um, but Mrs. Conley is also on, and she's out there every morning and every afternoon, and um, is the person who does help us with our buses, trying to make that turn. Um, she has some really good ideas that she could articulate probably much better than me. Um, I do want it to be con convenient for everybody. I want it to be safe for everybody. I don't think the answer is having our students be dropped off at an alternate location to walk onto our school property. And I do, I, I do um, think that a study would be a really good way to go for us. Um, that would be extremely helpful. So Lisa, do you, is there anything that we can do before school starts that you think would be helpful? Well, having police presence has been very helpful for us. Um, that slows traffic down. People seem to pay attention when they see that there is um, a police vehicle in the, at the intersection um, that was very successful for us in the spring. And um, I think that I, I would like to really see what has happened now that we've changed. Um, the the four-way intersection, it is going to be different. I know that now that the sidewalks are open, our children can walk on the um, office on the side of the road that um, that allows them not to have to cross as many times before they get to the school campus, which is going to be a big help. They can essentially step onto a crosswalk and walk directly onto the school property without having to cross the street. And so now the challenge is, you know, the traffic and the buses going in and out um, of the school driveway. So for the start of the school year, I would say that extra help with the police presence would be fantastic. 
which they have off, they have provided for us, um, and that has worked really well. Who else is uh, wants to speak? Is it Jean Marie? You're muted. Thanks all. Uh, and Jesse, I did want to say you uh, did uh, announce my title correctly. So <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, I am definitely the newbie here. I've only been with the district for a couple months, um, but I wanted to really um, one of the reasons why I was here tonight was just to really thank the council for bringing this topic forward because the safe routes to school team and the school district have struggled with this and have gone kind of round and round with what are the um, solutions that we can come up with to making this a safer intersection for the drivers and for the, the students. So I appreciate this being on the docket at all. Um, it's my understanding that I know one of the uh, so, suggestions that came up last at our last meeting and was on the agenda this evening was to have the buses only go to the left. Um, Souk, as the um, volunteer crossing guard, can speak to that better than I can, but it's the trouble is that we have to stop traffic to get those buses in and out, and there's a concern that you know, your average citizen in this role is not being respected in the way that a law enforcement officer is, um, which is why we've had such struggles in finding crossing guards or traffic monitors, uh, not only in this in this location, but at other locations where folks are just, it's scary being out in the road and asking traffic to stop. So um, I wanted to add that. And I saw one of the other comments um, that was added into the memo this evening was to have smaller buses going in and out of there. Um, likely you all know that we've struggled with getting bus drivers, having enough folks to drive our students safely to and from school. That problem unfortunately hasn't gotten any better in the last several months. And so having smaller buses you know it's our goal to have get as many little folks onto those buses as we safely can to get them in and out of school with a limited number of bus drivers that we have so uh, we have a very small number of smaller buses so even use using a smaller bus while it seems like a great idea isn't really a, a great solution for us considering all the other um, issues going on in transportation so um, but I really would defer to Sue because I think she has more um, boots on the ground experience than any of us do so thank you for your time tonight folks I just want to remind folks that Burlington made a huge mistake when they redeveloped the intersections of uh, Shelburne, I mean, St. Paul, which is actually Shelburne, St. Paul and Maple, St. Paul and King, right? Because they uh, they tried to make it super pedestrian friendly, which they did. But unfortunately, the turn radiuses were too tight and people were scratching and scraping and denting the, the, the corner panels of their cars as they tried to go around those those corners. And they ended up going in and cutting down all of that granite, right? They reshaped it and reduced the, the height. So they, they, and they corrected the radii so that it, it improved the, the ability of the traffic. Now, you, you can't take those, you have to be very careful in those corners today, even. Um, but they effectively did, you know, create some traffic calming because of that. But before it was, it was literally destructive to the cars. You couldn't tell based on the radius. So, I mean, I look at these diagrams and I go, maybe we made those radii a little bit too large, right? And so a study might have to tell us that we need to go back in and, and do some cutting. I don't know, but... Um, Jim, can I? Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, I, I have had many conversations with Sue. I, Ari, uh, as a former school board member and um, as a grandparent who drives into the Rick Marcus, Marcotte Central School routinely, um, the design and the operation there during drop-off and pickup hours is really, really difficult. And I also believe it's unsafe. Um, I really want to be part of a solution moving forward, but I think it's a lot to ask of a school district to go another year to start another school year without a solution that doesn't require 
staff picking up students in a, in a different location that doesn't um, tax parents to learn uh, or and guardians to learn a new route um, that you know might uh, tax new bus drivers to do something different. I think there are some longer term solutions that potentially could have buses making a straight shot off the street from the Poon property, potentially doing a loop around that might utilize Mary Street. So it's, uh, you don't have as much traffic coming in. It, again, it's for a very short, two very short intense periods of the day. Um, but uh, I have witnessed the buses lining up. I've witnessed the intersection and, you know, Sue's valiant efforts to keep safe and um, uh, uh, operate um, kind of as an independent person at the intersection. I know this would not be a popular decision, but I have become convinced that I think some sort of law enforcement presence at the start of the school year would serve to set the tone and send the message that this is, uh, this is gonna be a change. I think if those uh, bars that Erica talked about could be moved back prior to the start of school and law enforcement is present so that drivers become more aware of that um, and, and um, can start to incorporate that pattern as the new school year kicks off and then uh, in, you know, investing in the right kind of study that would really look at a long-term solution that um, isn't completely incumbent on the school district modifying its current practices as well as potentially having to utilize um, highly compensated staff to become traffic folks. And I, I've seen Lissa walking kids through the library to get them out safely to the street. I've seen a number of actually probably more than a half a dozen staff members that have to manage the um, loading of the buses and things like that. And there definitely has been a tax on school resources associated with the traffic patterns that have developed as a result of um, city center. And, and I, I'm also thinking about the growth and the vibrancy that we want in city center. That is only gonna continue. So coming up with a solution that really sets the tone sooner versus later, I, I think is really incumbent on us as a council to support that. Thanks, Tim. You're welcome. Ryan Doyle. Hi, uh, yeah, Ryan Doyle speaking. Perhaps my favorite subject is road geometry um, and safe, safe routes to school. But um, instead of speaking about that for an hour. I'm just going to reiterate what Elizabeth said about having police presence at the beginning of the school year to set the tone. And I would add that whenever students are returning from a school vacation, we really should understand what that school schedule is so that we can always have police reinforcing after those breaks immediately and having periodic uh, sporadic drop-ins um, even during the other times of the year, just so that drivers don't become complacent. Um, there might be some other short-term things we can do along with if if the decisions made to move stop bars back, uh, some other road painting, which might not be super permanent, but might be colorful or vivid that just gets more attention from the drivers in the way they don't experience anywhere else. It's a small thing that just helps have a little bit more impact along with possibly a little bit more signage in the area um, about what's going on uh, at those stop bars. I think geometry is ultimately the long-term goal and changing that to fit all users. Um, the only thing I wanted to clarify with Erica was that um, regarding the Allard Square right-of-way, I interpreted what you wrote to imply that that might be in play. There are potential options. We have not gone through all of the language and history around how that agreement came to be, but there is um, access allowable for the public because of City Hall and the library being here, I think was the impetus for it. Jesse or a lawyer, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but that allows a public access. Um, it doesn't 
refer to the school, uh, but it is between the city and Allard Square. Gotcha. Thank you. Tom, is that accurate? You, I yeah. think you were more in that. I, I wrote that, Ryan. I, I was trying to be very careful. I think there's some interpretation to be done there. So I just, what Erica said, plus, I guess, reread it in the context. Um, Thanks. Thank you. Right. Sure. Um, so Jean Marie is, thank you, Jean Marie, for putting this in the chat, is saying, I do want to be sure that the council knows that Chief Burke has agreed to be an, have an officer present whenever he can, but we also understand he has other priorities and staffing concerns. So again, staff to staff are working on those kinds of solutions. Um, just, and I agree with Jean Marie, I think there's every intention of having and prioritizing school safety with law enforcement at Rick Marcotte um, at the beginning of the school year. I do want to know we have one school resource officer covering six schools. Um, we have, uh, I believe it's six or seven police vacancies right now, and we only ever have three police officers on at any one time. So a big event. The challenge for us in committing to the school is a big event happens and for an emergent reason, we have to pull folks off. So I appreciate the partnership on that, Jean Marie. Thank you for bringing up that point. Mike? Um, yes, I, I think we can't escape in the end of the day that, you know, it sounds like um, staff staff conversation will find the best way to uh, be sure that this school year starts off uh, in the various sort of slight mitigation that is maybe be possible by sporadic presence by the police and moving back to stop signs. Uh, but ultimately, I think fundamentally is the decision is, you know, investing in a a person who can look whether if staff doesn't have the time and resources, and I know they're stretched in some ways, it may be, you know, uh, someone who in close coordination with the city, uh, the evolving dynamic area that we're now, we know is going to be city center and the schools uh, basically uh, propose some longer term permanent solutions because uh, we can't get away from that. And, you know, the sooner we start that path and that process, which is a long path, the better. And so I, th I think that's got us to be a priority yeah. for today or in the very near future. Thanks, Mike. Anybody in the audience when you come forward, please? And uh, make sure that green bright light is on and identify yourself. Bright green. Okay, bright green. Um, I'm Sue pull Conley. The mic close to you, yeah. I'm Sue Conley. Um, I do the intersection. Um, what I'm here to basically say is the dynamics from the end of the school year to what may happen in the beginning of the school year now that you have new buildings opening up with m many more uh, pedestrians, students, cars, et cetera. That I think that intersection, along with the fact that it's been um, it's changing to where you're putting the crosswalk now that's directly for the city hall is moving further east. It's going to make the radius for the buses turning out of Rick Marcotte even tighter and more difficult, along with the traffic that, that's going to be behind. Um, the intersection being lined up is perfect and great. Only having somebody out there trying to get the buses in and out is going to be difficult. And the two um parking spaces that we used to have blocked so we could get the buses in and out are now completely open um my suggestion is i think you permanently or at least for certain times of the day need to keep certain spaces out on market street no parking so the buses can get in and out make a wide a wider turn i also think that it's time or it might be the perfect time for the city to consider hiring a, what I consider a community engagement officer, which would be more than a bike patrol person, but less than a police officer, but have a presence of authority because being in that intersection is dangerous and unsafe. And I had gotten to the point last, I think it was like last March, traffic and the road rage and the lack of respect is just is stunning out there we have people on their cell phones you know not only going into the school but we have people 
that just go right through the stop line steins and I can be in the middle of the road and somebody will go around me. So my idea is with city center becoming vibrant, becoming more populated, I'm thinking that the city might want to consider um, having a community engagement officer that not only is part of this intersection, but you're going to have parking issues. You're going to have illegal parking. You're going to have a lot of things going on where you have you have patrol officers right now that you know are park are patrolling Market Street, et cetera. Maybe it's time to have a less than police officer, but authority that works under the police department that can actually do that intersection and not have to have the you know an Aaron Schwartz show up to to help us and it may be even more cost effective. But it's getting it's getting too dangerous. It, it's just it's it's too dangerous at this point. And now we've got a lot of more. We have no idea what's going to happen when we come back and you've got all these buildings filled up. How many? How much more traffic is going to be on Market Street? And the road rage is it's bad. So I would hope you would consider hiring. I've talked to Chief Burke you know, in our little banters um, about the possibility of having somebody that was in between a, you know, a park patrol versus a, a police officer that could do a lot of things within the city center, maybe collaborate with SB 3C in, in what you're gonna need down in your downtown. Um, but I think it, it's becoming, it's not reasonable for me to be out there anymore. And, and it's not reasonable for a, tra a crossing guard. Um, it's definitely not crossing guard job. Um, but the buses cannot get in and out. And putting the stop bars back, I don't think it's going to help because cars don't follow the rules. Period. Good. Thank you. Yep. So, what's our pleasure? I think we need to study. We need to do something before school starts, though. Yeah. So besides saying we need to study, which is not going to produce any difference <laughs> by the time school starts, we need staff to tell us what's doable and what I, they think would be effective. I just heard a repeat of having a traffic control officer. It may, and it may not be a police officer. I hear we've raised some money to, or authorized some money to do that, which the school hasn't found a way to fill. Is, can that money be allocated in a way so that we can get somebody in a traffic control uniform who's skilled at doing that to be at that intersection for those time periods? How do we do that? Well, it sounds like the, the chief has offered to have somebody there when they can have somebody there, but not all the time, especially if they get a call, right? So that's that's the risk. Is that they no, no, but, but the question is, um, so I, I agree with Lori, and look, it may, time is short, but... Um, not to have um, one of Chief Burke's um, personnel there, but to have someone that's not, um, you know, trained as a police officer, but is trained in traffic control that um, would um, perhaps be perceived by the public as uh, having more official capacity, you know, depending upon how the person was dressed, what authority they had, that would be permanently stationed there until and unless there's a, you know, permanent, um, geography solution, you know, geometric solution, infrastructure solution. The the fairgrounds and mm -hmm. higher ground concerts and any big traffic event has people who do this. They're out there. They're hireable. I don't know what we can do to to try to find one of them and what the cost will be. But having the police there sometime is great but when they're not there if people aren't cooperating and it's a dangerous situation that's that's a not a great solution so let's so perhaps if i may let's suggest that we uh, uh instruct staff to come back to us what it would take to get that immediate solution of a person of authority to, at the level necessary but at the same time I agree with what Andrew said at the same time to not delay in starting the study uh, because that's the ultimate solution and, the, and we need to get that going uh, because otherwise we will be, uh, you know, be 
challenged for this uh, forever. Uh, so is that an option, Jesse? Can we instruct you to come, you and your team to come forward with how do we get the person of authority and what is the cost? And in the meantime, start the RFP for uh, you know, uh, the necessary study to get to a, a, a permanent comprehensive solution that fits within the dynamic uh, you know, city environment we all want and the safety for the kids at the school that is necessary. Um, so we can absolutely bring you back a proposal on hiring an engineer to do a study. Um, you know, I, I, this is um, a really challenging thing because the we are revisiting conversations the council and the school have had time and time again. We can try and hire somebody in two weeks. They've had, you know, they've been working on this for two years and haven't had a whole lot of success on it. Um, so, we can do so, our so best, Jesse, but I, 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 I'm, I, I'm really afraid that we are going to make a promise tonight that we're not going to be able to keep and we are going to continually disappoint our community um, instead of, sure. kind of picking a path and staying with it. So we will do our best. I think Chief Burke has, as Jean Marie and others have said, have committed to doing our absolute best to have somebody there at the beginning of school. I really, we have got to find a way, and I'm hoping this is part of the Safe Routes to School work to change the culture. I don't think it's okay to say the drivers are bad. They're just going to be bad. I think that that is, we have to eat, do better for one another and no amount of, you know, Police officers with guns are great. They're not who we want standing guard in front of our schools, I don't think. Um, sure. And there's only sure. so much culture change we can do that way. So I, we can do our best, but I, I, I'm afraid we are going to disappoint. Jesse, Jesse if I, I may, this is Lissa again. Go ahead, Lissa. Okay, thank you so much. Um, First of all, everybody, thank you for this conversation. I'm I'm feeling better, even though we don't have an answer right now. Um, I'm feeling so much better about having more people discuss this and, and look for solutions. So I echo what Jean Marie said um, about our appreciation for all of you. Um, I didn't think that the Allard Square um, topic was even a possibility to discuss anymore. Um, and Tom, you forgive me, but I'm, I'm going to bring it up again. <laughs> um, it was one of the first solutions I proposed when I became the principal at Rick Marcotte Central School. I understand that is a driveway for Allard Square and there is an agreement with the city. Um, we have not been allowed to use that um, exit from our parking lot. Um, which um, if we were allowed to use it, we could funnel traffic um, out of our school ca campus in a different direction. And that would ease the traffic that there's only one way in and one way out of that school driveway at the time, at the moment. Um, there are barrels that block the back corner of my um, school parking lot so that vehicles do not take a right-hand turn and go out behind Allard Square. If Mary Street was open, people could take a right onto Mary Street and exit out Williston Road, or they could continue um, around and get to Market Street in a, um, down on the other side of Allard Square. Um, the, I think one of the problems is this one way in and one way out. And that's why we get all of the tr congestion. Um, it's not just our school traffic. We have many citizens that are using City Hall in the morning. There are some groups that park along the side on the sidewalk, which then narrows the opportunity for buses um, to pass on that um, school driveway. I just think that one solution could be to get an agreement for us to open up that other exit from our school parking lot, and that might ease some of the congestion on Market Street. So that's a that's a good suggestion, um, and I'd like I think staff could look at that. So just yes, we can look at that. I we we would need some help from Lissa and Jean Marie that the. We are an organization that has an agreement with Allard Square. They are their own organization that 
would need that agreement. So I don't think the city can necessarily negotiate that on behalf of the school, but we certainly could help and assist and have relationships and whatnot. And, and I would suggest that the school actually take a bus and try it as well, just to make sure. Do a test. Well, if it was, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, yes, we could practice with the bus, but we could also, we know vehicles can make that turn easily. And okay. so if vehicles were going out of the school, the school parking lot in a, in a different direction, we yeah. wouldn't have all... Mm all of that back up. That's and true. that was the first thing I tried. The first thing I did was I, I made friends with the people from Allard Square and, and the people at City Hall. And I said, I'm your neighbor. Here we are back here. Let's work together. And um, it was a no right from the beginning. The, um, the, the question is, is, could we please just have vehicles take a right out the back of our parking lot? Um, I thought it was a non-starter and maybe, and now I'm hearing that maybe we can open up some communication um, to make that, to, to maybe make that a possibility. So Jesse, if, if you would help me, if somebody um, from the city could help me with the conversation, that would be wonderful. Of course, thanks. Well, and, and particularly mm -hmm. if it were presented in the context of um, being done concurrently with an engineering study, that might come up with a more permanent geometric solution, then it might be a temporary situation being able to utilize that. But I, again, I've seen people, Lisa, you probably would um, pale, but you might, if I've seen it, you've seen it, is people literally moving those barrels to drive out and use that mm -hmm. um, from the school parking lot to access Mary Street mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, when they don't want to. Yes, and my friends. I have some friends who are residents at Allard Square. They have my cell phone number, and they call me when that happens. <laughs> so I, I, I either witness it or I get a phone call immediately um, to notify me that that's happened again. But that just goes to show um, there are parents who are really frustrated, and they feel like they're stuck and there's no place to go. And if they really have to get out of that parking lot and they see that as an opportunity, I, um, I, I I understand why a couple of people have left their vehicle to move those barrels and get out of that parking lot quickly in situations that were both emergency. Uh, you know, this story to me was I could not wait in that traffic. I had an emergency and I had to go. And so I forgave them and I did have conversations, but I, I am well aware that Allard Square residents are paying close attention to any traffic that turns right out of our school parking lot. Yeah. Uh, Mike McTagg, did you have a comment? Well, one of them was what Lisa just mentioned, which was <laughs> that we could have the buses uh, going in one direction only, entry uh, in the, the current entry, entry uh, road and exit uh, to the to the north through uh, via the Allard Square driveway, then you would only have the, go, the buses going in in one place and out in another, and they could go in either direction at, at that exit. Um, but the other, uh, I think Alyssa, Alyssa has already covered this. The other thing is, in the short term, it might you might be able to hire um, somebody who is already trained from one of the flagging companies that we use when we're doing road construction. Not, not the ones who hold the pole, which is go slow and stop, but um, uh, they must have people who are trained to manage traffic. Which would be the people that hold the pole that they turn back and forth to say stop. And go. <laughs> <laughs> A little different. <laughs> I'm sure they have other we, we have reached out to those companies and they see it as a bit of fairly small job and they haven't been able to send us anybody. Um, and I believe that um, Snyder Braverman also tried to reach out um, to some of somebody to help us in that way. And they were not successful at securing somebody to do that work for us, but that was a few months ago and maybe, maybe things are different now, but we, we did start with trying to find people who professionally do that. Um, and we were told that the job wasn't a big enough one for them to, to send to, somebody. We're going to have to start a draft. 
conscription. <laughs> Michael right. Scanlon. Yes, just a clarifying question for Jesse to be sure I understood her correctly. Jesse, when you said, uh, you know, we don't want to raise expectations that might not be fulfilled. Was that in reference to the engineering study? Is that based on what's been done in the past? Uh, you and your staff have come to the judgment that there just really aren't any other, let's call them geometric or engineering options. Uh, and therefore the study is, 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 is something that basically will not produce another option. I'm just trying to just to clarify. No, sorry, it was the reverse. So yeah, the sorry. hiring engineers and doing oh, capital okay. projects is well within our core expertise. We know how to do that and we can move that forward quickly. Um, we don't employ crossing guards or um, community engagement okay. okay, specialists. That just getting that, that done in two that, weeks will be very right. challenging. No, thank, thank you. I was just thinking a bad news story. They're like, sorry, we, we've tried. There are no options. But if, if that's not the case, that's good. Okay, thank you. So what I'm hearing is that the, the things that we can that we can pull on immediately are our discussion with Allard Square about possibly using that as an exit, um, the position of the stop bars, and also elimination of some parking spots, either temporarily twice a day or just eliminating them, period. I don't know which. But um, those are the three uh, levers that I see so far. Um, if anybody has, besides trying to find somebody to, you know, be a traffic control person, uh, in addition to whatever the uh, the police can furnish at those at the beginning of school. So I think all we can do is at this point, I mean, I'm glad to, to join the council to say, let's put an RFP out for somebody to give us a better design. But right now, I, in parallel, we need to, to do these other three things. Somebody else would like to speak. Is opening up. Hold on a second. Sorry. So, can I identify yourself, please? Bright green. Is it on? Oh my gosh. I did it right. Um, my name is Amanda Hannaford. I, um, I don't have children in the school. I don't. Um, I've not really known about this issue much before tonight. But my thought is like, what would change if somebody were injured or killed. Like, I mean, I, I hear all of these um, roadblocks and they, it does seem like a difficult issue, but, um, but it seems like it's kind of urgent and, and that somebody could really, it is very unsafe. And I sort of helped deal with pedestrian safety at the University of Vermont and, you know, bad things happen um, on roads. I have also noticed I recently moved from a few years ago from Burlington to South Burlington, and I've noticed a difference in the culture of drivers in Burlington and South Burlington. Um, just when I'm crossing Market Street, people don't stop for me in the crosswalk. Like, <laughs> and and um, crossing guards at the schools in Burlington, like people do stop for them. And I see them not stop here. And I don't know, it seems like a different culture in South Burlington. And it might be because people are coming from places where they drive faster and then they have to slow down. But I think, I think there could be some culture education. And I don't know if it's like, you know, I think police officers help. I don't know if it's somebody handing out flyers explaining the importance of of people slowing down and and respecting um, drivers, but it just um, I just so I just wanted to say those things. Thank you, Lisa. You wanted to say something? Um, yes, thank you. That that was very accurate. Thank you for for making those comments <laughs> because the, the, those are comments that um, the, the school personnel and Sue Conley we've been making. Um, for the last two years. So it's, it's nice to ha um, have somebody else notice the same thing. Um, what I, I wanted, I wondered if a fourth solution would be to open up Mary Street so that um, people, if we were, if we were allowed to use the Allard Square portion of their driveway and allow traffic to then use Mary Street to get to Williston Road if that would help as well. 
That's and true. then people would have two options. They could take Mary Street to Williston Road, or they could continue around Allard Square and then get out um, on the west side of of Market Street instead of um, the one the one option which we have now. Thank you. Um, what about using the uh, Marcotte School driveway that goes out to Williston Road for one-way traffic during this time period? Are, are you asking me? Are you asking Lisa McDonald about that? Yes, I was. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's it's it's not really a road there. It is a paved area, very close to classroom um, windows. Um, and we would have to do some work there. The, um, the turn onto Williston Road could be quite treacherous. Um, and that's four lanes of traffic if you're trying to go toward the interstate. So that's, um, I'd be a little worried about that without some kind of construction some fencing would have to be removed in order for that to work. And that is, that's an area that might get some work coming soon. So that could be another, it could be an opportunity for the future. Okay. But that is pretty fast traffic. People, people aren't even walking on that sidewalk at, at the moment because it's, you know, it's not very conducive to even pedestrians. I think it would only be viable for right-hand turns if it was used at all. Right. But that could yeah, release, the left-hand turn would be That could really impossible the traffic pressure, even temporarily, just to, to get a fix for this issue going forward immediately. I, I do think, Lori, that space could be considered by an engineer as part of an overall solution. Um, I mean, there's no light there, so it's, it, it's tough. But it should be considered as part of available space as maybe part of the solution. There's also not, no light at Mary Street either, right? Not another consideration. Ryan Doyle, short comment? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so M Mary Street doesn't have a light, but you can go from Mary Street to the light at the hotel. Um, that is a controlled signal. And the driveway beside the school is currently... Um, fenced over um, to allow it to open up at two times a day for buses, it would also have to be able to entirely close off again um, after them because after that little space by the building near Williston Road is used as an outing area for the kindergarten and making sure that that is not accessible um, by the public um, is really important for the school and its safety concerns. So. Like Elizabeth said, I think long term that can be in play, but to try to do something short term with it would become overly cumbersome uh, very fast and create another safety issue. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we've pretty much exhausted this discussion. So we have a number of items here that are possible that staff look, is going to have to give do some feedback on. Do we need to make a motion regarding an RFP? No. No, I think you've provided us guidance and we'll bring you back on the funding allocation request. Great. Thank you. And we should revisit this when? I mean, uh, when we have something to provide you an update on. Oh, okay. <clears throat> but at the minimum, we, we should really think about is this something that we can do that at least symbolically gets us somewhere, even if 60% of the drivers adhere to it, right? Whether it's moving, you know, eliminating parking spaces or moving the, the stop bars, whatever it is, right? If it ends up giving relief to, you know, at least half of the bus movements on a given day, that's improvement. So, okay. Thank you. Thanks everybody for that uh, input. That was a good discussion. Um, we'll be talking about it some more. Turn oh, up. turn up. So um, 
we might want to move around uh, the item 12 and 13 if the council is amenable to that and, and move 13 to the next item and 12 after that because I think there's some people here that are concerned about uh, item uh, 13. So why don't we skip 12 and go right to 13, which is the uh, discuss chapter 14, article two, nuisances of our code of ordinances and outline the goals the council is trying to achieve and provide direction to staff. Tim, would it so, be okay if I kick it off? Uh, oh. it does, do you have something you want to start off with? or? This is also a council request. Oh, okay. Well, if it's council request, then okay. go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, so Lori and I um, put together a document which recommends certain changes to our nuisance ordinance and the performance standards in our LDRs. And the recommendations really are off the back of, um, I think, multiple years of multiple incidents where there's been a noise that's been difficult for staff, the council, and the community to address because of, I think, probably some infirmities in our existing regulations. And uh, the goal that Laura and I have is, uh, one, um, to address those infirmities and, and then a couple other goals. So just to kind of lay it out, there's kind of three parts to the recommendations. One is to provide an objective, clear metric for daytime noise that everyone can look to and determine easily without discretion and subjectivity whether the standard's been violated or not. So that's, that's one. Um, second part of this discussion is to consider uh, noise limits on leaf blows, hedge trimmers, and string tr hedge trimmers and string trimmers. Um, the third part of this is that we have two sets of rules governing noise, and I think that's also created a lot of confusion about who enforces the rules, what rules are applicable. We have a set of noise rules in the LDRs, which governs much more than uh, development noise. It governs autos and parties and all kinds of things, and we have a separate noise uh, set of rules in the new ordinance. And I think. Um, a lot of confusion would be avoided if we consolidated those into one set of rules. So I just want to go back to the part one, the objective standard. Um, we did a lot of research, and it seems like the vast, well, the majority, I would say, of municipalities around the country have an objective decibel metric for noise, and uh, most of our um, neighboring communities have an objective um decibel uh, rating, uh, you know, standard for daytime noise. Our ordinances already have decibel ratings for nighttime noise, but for some reason don't have daytime noise. I'm not really sure why that is. Um, there's also a question about how to measure noise. So just to get technical for a moment, you can measure noise at a moment in time, say over one eighth of a second. You can measure noise over a period, 10 minutes, a half hour, an hour. Our noise ordinance at night measures it over a period, which is, um, as we've discussed with some uh, experts in this, not really recommended. And you can see why. Let's say you have a loud noise like hammering going on, but it occurs every 10 seconds, and it's 90 decibels at that moment in time, and then say 30 decibels for the nine seconds in between, and so on and so on for an hour, the average measurement is gonna be pretty low, even though that noise is really horrific and is not something that we should tolerate. So um, the other part of this recommendation is to change how we measure noise to be more of an instantaneous measurement, which is a recommendation from the noise experts we talk to. Um, we've also put forward for consideration by staff council for discussion um, whether there should be and what it might look like to have some consideration for construction noise. I will say the vast majority of jurisdictions, having read a lot of these ordinances, don't have any such provision. A handful do. Um, and we can talk about what that might look like if there should be one um, and all that. So that's kind of what I have to say. Lori, did... I don't have a lot to add to what you said, um, except that this is a, a, a delicate issue. Um, finding the balance between quiet enjoyment of our property and enabling people to 
um, do the construction things that need to be done or work on their property that, that has to happen. And the ordinance needs to be developed in a way that finds a balance that that meets the needs of the community at large. Um, and while I have signed on to this draft with you, Andrew, and, and support it, um, I do support if, as we move forward with this, that we get uh, consultancy from a noise expert to make sure that the metrics and the um, levels, et cetera, that we are considering are realistic, enforceable, and uh, suitable for their intention. Elizabeth, comments? Um, I have a lot of comments on this. Um, I think the first thing is the specific, uh, one, I have not received any data as a counselor on the number of complaints that we have had as a city specific to noise. I have personally been aware, attended meetings, and um, have been aware as a homeowner of specific jackhammering noise associated with um, the uh, um, rock drilling that occurred up near Long Drive um, last summer. And I would agree that that level, the frequency and the uh, period of time that that went on was extremely disruptive to homeowners and residents in that area. Um, I don't know what, um, I don't know if that is the specific area that's being addressed, but I also know we have heard, um, so I, I, I would want the data on the other noise, the leaf blower, hedge trimmer noise. Um, we have heard feedback from the community on the noise of pickleball. So I would want to know the collateral impact of a noise ordinance on um, that, as well as any other things we haven't anticipated. And I would assume if there are uh, issues that residents have had with um, noise pollution or the nuisance of noise, we would have documentation that the city could share with us. Um, I have a fundamental issue, and, I, and I've shared it with Andrew, just around the role of us as counselors in doing the work of modifying ordinances. Um, my, my own feeling is, I, I'll speak for myself, I don't have the expertise to develop language for you all to consider relative to an ordinance. Um, and I don't, I do not believe I was elected to do that. I'm not compensated as a city employee. I believe we have experts on staff that if this is a priority for council, we should be directing those experts to develop a recommendation that we can respond to as council. Um, the, uh, the other area for me is really around, I, I appreciate the work Andrew's done. I, I don't know that we've had an issue with a conflicting, um, I, I would want to hear also from city about the conflict between um, the nuisance ordi ordinances through the LDRs versus the ordinance as well. Sort of, is there a need to meld those? Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm responding on a lot of levels, but the other area is the topic we're going to postpone our discussion on until after this one, which is on where this falls within the work plan priority for both council as well as for city staff. Um, I, with all of that said, I appreciate the specific significant noise issue that we would want to address with the jackhammering, and I think the city has done uh, a, some of that in in a um, agreement that would limit that for a period of time with some other concessions. I I, I think that's publicly available, um, and it involves one property that I'm aware of. Um, but I think we, there's a lot more to consider to avoid um, issues of noise that 
contribute to ongoing quality of living issues for all residents around the city. And I, I feel like I need a lot more information there and just to make sure, but also to have the capacity to, to allow our city staff to deal with short-term issues where we know there's um, an issue. And, and that specific short-term issue has been the, the jackhammering one. Th those are some of my observations and comments. Thank you, Elizabeth. I agree with you on, on several of those points. Um, Mike Scanlon, are you on? I, you're not raising your hand, but not sure if you wanted to make a comment now. Yes, uh, I, I would uh, also share many of the points, uh, perspectives that um, uh, Elizabeth just made, ranging from uh, the role uh, and expertise uh, of the staff versus the council responsibilities. Um, uh, I also share very much what Lori said. It's, it's, this is a very sensitive issue. We need to find a, a correct balance. And I think perhaps uh, the, the right step at this point, uh, I think this is what he alluded to, was you know, to hand it over to consultants slash staff to basically seek that balance because it obviously has implications for uh, growth that is going to occur, uh, uh, construction that will occur. Uh, yeah, there's no question the jackhammering was a, uh, clearly a, a, a flashpoint for that. And I think we've seen that the city has tried to go forward to find ways to mitigate that. Um, so, uh, but also, I, I also fully agree that it goes into the broader issue of, you know, what are our priorities? I, I think, as I mentioned before, um, I still think of our city plan as our, our objective. We have some master plans in there, ranging from the city and park to uh, the economic, to culture, uh, housing, act to transportation. Um, you know, I, I think we need to really flush those out. And so I, I guess I would look to the city, uh, to Jesse and her team to tell us, you know, kind of, you know, how do we get the master plans in place? How would this distract from that or fit into this? Uh, but, you know, I, I think if we're serious about the city plan, we need to get the fundamentals down uh, because they serve as a guide to us, as well as a very much needed discussion about revenue generation, because ultimately all these things, uh, you know, staff time means money, it means services, and we need to also have, I think, a comprehensive discussion on revenue generation if we are going to take on more and more tasks. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I'm trying to think about what's, What's fundamentally broken, if anything is broken, in, in our noise management in the city, right? And obviously, since the pandemic year of 2020, when the ledge hammering started up at Long Drive, that was a very long summer for a lot of people. And then the next summer, there was a swale that had to be chipped out. And then last year, there was uh, a foundation that had to be dug out as well. And um, and I think we've, we've all agreed that that... that ledge chipping, right, uh, is detrimental to quality of life, especially in, in that neighborhood, right? And and we've, we've tried to deal with that, I think, in an effective way. So the other issues like leaf blowers and, and lawnmowers, um, I don't, even though leaf blowers are, uh, they're very annoying to me in my own neighborhood because they all come on like Monday morning, I guess, right? And they blow for like three hours, it seems like. And I just wonder why the, the grass has to be blown around. But, but to me, the argument about those is more for pollution and and air quality, and it's like an energy climate change type uh, question, not so much noise. I mean, and Burlington has changed their their um, their code for that as well, and I'm I'm willing to talk about that. But but for the noise issue, uh, I'm I'm worried that we might have unintended consequences. So, for example, in my neighborhood, you know, there was a particularly con you know. Uh, complex roof house that took three days of like nine guys going kapuk, 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 you know uh, you know nailing that roof and and doing the whole thing and so i i wouldn't want that to be um a violation under this because the person has to replace the roof and they're not going to find any other way to do it other than having a, a you know a swarm of people on their roof for three days you know shooting nails into it and, and if it had been three more houses that on that same street, you know, over the course of the next week and a half, they would have had to put up with it. And I'm sure the people on on Park Road, right, they and, and parts of those condos and golf course road, they replaced all of their shingles, I think, uh, in the last summer. 
And so I'm sure there was a lot of noise from that as well. But so some noise you have to deal with because it's either part of construction that has to happen or it's part of maintenance on buildings. Um, but the, the constant jackhammering for the ledge, that, that really um, was, was too much. And, and I agree with that. So um, I agree with Elizabeth. I, I think staff should, should be the, 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 you know, they should be the ones to deal with trying to reconcile whether there's a problem having the two different ordinances and, and, and how we codify some, you know, uh, something about jackhammering and what those other nuisances are. Um, otherwise, I, 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 you know, at least from my personal point of view, I haven't heard other complaints about types of noise that, that you know, that they, they get complaints about, you know. I mean, I, I don't think I've, the only time I, I was concerned once was when they, they started working on a house on Sadie Lane before seven o'clock in the morning, right? And I said this before, and and somebody complained to the police before I did, and by the time I got there at seven at seven forty five, the foreman said we were, the police came by and told us don't start till seven o'clock, and so they didn't after that. So, to me, that's the, the most one of the most important parts is that you know garbage pickup noise, construction noise, those have to adhere to the times, you know the the quiet times, and they can't start before seven a.m. And they have to be finished by whatever the finish time is. So, anyway, so I, I don't know where you want to go with this. Uh, you've done a lot of work. On, yeah, I, Tim. I, let me just say a couple of things. So, one, um, you know, I guess um, the we only have authority to regulate noise. So that's why the leaf blower, string trim, and not lawnmower was brought up as part of this. But I, I certainly agree with you. But lawnmowers are another issue, right? Because they yeah, spew. But nobody regulates them yet. Well, no, but but I'm, I'm saying, you know, you the really thing is, can. is that, you know, in our neighborhood, yeah. I've watched house after house after house <laughs> switch over to electric mowers, <laughs> yeah. right? Which is great. But yeah. some people don't because they're waiting for yeah. it to get too old. Look, we can maybe provide incentives for that. But anyways, but this, this is focused on leaf blowers and the string trimmers because it's just like at this point I think over 150 municipalities around the country that have done that through their noise ordinances which is what most municipalities have the power to regulate so that's why the suggestion is there um, for that and um, you'll see what I try to write here and I'll come back to the responsibilities in a moment is is something which reasonably does address what you what you're referencing people have to obviously be able to maintain their homes and i'd love staff feedback on that and i agree with laurie and as I, we both suggested in the memo to get professional feedback to make sure we got that right we should do that but with all that being said i feel really strongly that we should follow the example of most of our neighbors around the country and have a clear metric for daytime noise i think that would eliminate a lot of disputes and a lot of arguments and a lot of confusion um, in terms of the responsibilities of council, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be able to do this stuff. I was a attorney, drafted lots of law for 30 years, and I'm happy to do it if it helps move the city forward and moves us along. Certainly, we're not all going to um, vote on what I wrote. It's going to staff can look at it, and staff will make recommendations. So, I'd like to make one comment on that, um, and I'd like to say, Elizabeth, I totally agree with you that um, the writing and the executing of a plan belongs in the hands of staff and my supporting of what was done was only to bring a framework forward to start this discussion and to be able to bring something forward saying we need I perceive Andrew perceives that there's a deficit in our current ordinance structure that needs to be addressed um, and the ledge chipping was certainly an issue that brought this to a head, but I'm aware of citizens having problems in the past with um, excessive noise from music late at night um, and other sources of noise, and noise pollution is becoming a bigger, bigger issue as our population grows, not only here, but nationally and globally. So I would like to see this segue with our policies and procedures that we um, have that we're not talking about till some other time. But um, I agree. I, I don't see what got brought forward as something that would be voted on in any way at all. It was a method to bring this conversation to the fore. But the, your objectives are, well, to establish the framework, but it doesn't specifically outlaw uh, jackhammering of ledge? No. 
Well, okay, so, I mean, what, what we wrote was that... Um, Why doesn't it outlaw Jack Henry and Pledge? One second. So, <laughs> what we wrote was a, six, a 60 decibel standard for daytime noise. That would effectively outlaw Jack Henry for Hedge, for Ledge. Um, the question is whether there should be any construction exemption. And there are cities around the country that have considered that. Most don't have it. Um, one city that seems to have something that's kind of reasonable is to, you know, allow for kind of that percursive noise for a short period of time um, during the day, during a weekday, you know, for one time for a project limited to 75 decibels. You know, whether that, you know, but that's like for discussion, that's for staff to react to, mm -hmm. noise experts to tell us is that reasonable, what do other people do, you know, lots of discussion around that. The idea for suggesting that was to allow for the things you mentioned, Tim, and, you know, maybe if the ledge is a half mile away and they limit it to 10 days, they can do that, but not allow for the type of ledge hammering that we saw in the community mm -hmm. over the past few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know, some of my, I guess one of my questions is, is there an opportunity through the permitting process to identify those issues in construction that might result in the significant in, in the significant noise options because there were some um, uh, remedies that I think were taken with another property that included test pits being drilled and an understanding of how many days might be required. Um, so, is there something in our permitting process that might be a precursor to identifying any potential issues of that? the, the um, jackhammering side of it. So it, it gives us some time to address the other issue. Um, and then, Lori, some of the things you mentioned, the current, current ordinance covers nighttime music. It's, it's like that's the whole, that's a lot of the ordinance right now. So amplification and so forth is very well covered in the current ordinance. Um, we have a lot of considerations um, based on our conversation at our last meeting. I'm not sure we wouldn't be eliminating pickleball at Szymanski based on what I heard of 10 hours of constant noise. I'm not sure if the proposed ordinance wouldn't be eliminating that. Um, so the, the measurement, who would be responsible for monitoring, enforcement, and, and anticipating some of the other collateral areas. Um, so I, I think we have a short-term issue of making sure we have a mechanism to address um, kind of where there's permitted construction coming that might include the chipping um, and then decide where the nuisance ordinance and, and a, you know, an update of that falls within our overall priorities. So is this enough to start the discussion with the staff? Or can oh, I know, no, I'm just asking a question now, Rick, before I go to the public, all right? Got so Mike. Michael. Yeah, I'm actually, Jesse, yeah, having heard all this, I mean, I assume that your staff would be in a position uh, to obviously give us the, what are the consequences of, of whatever the proposals are in terms of uh, building costs, additional staff time, police supervision, um, and, and, and give us a sense of what the trade-off is. Because often I, I find that, you know, when we talk about issues and in an absence of if we choose to do X or we prioritize X, I think you know, we obviously are going to do this at some point in time. But if we prioritize it, you know, what, what is the cost of trade off for other issues? And I guess that's what lends into our next discussion. Somehow I think the two are related. Yeah, I think, you know, staff has not, we take direction, staff takes policy direction from three or more of you. So we have not looked at um, this specific proposal yet. If you all want to, if majority of you want to direct us to spend time answering many of these questions that have come up tonight, uh, we can certainly do that. And um, it, we, I guess I need your um, guidance on what, how high is this a priority as compared to other things? And I think maybe during other business, we should have kind of a check-in on upcoming agendas um, and how you want to spend your next Monday nights hmm. and how quickly we can be responsive to those things. 
Okay. How many people in the audience want to speak? Oh, a lot. Okay. All right. Well, if you can come down to the microphone and uh, one at a time, you pick. All right. And uh, have your say and identify yourself before you start talking. And, and if, if you end up saying the same things over and over again, right, just just say, I, I agree with what the gentleman before me or the person before me said. Okay. Is the green light on? Okay. It's not on yet. Big green light. Okay. I agree. It's 10 o'clock at night. It's getting late. Um, my name is John Allen. Uh, I am a landowner of 80 Long Drive. So we have dealt with this pain. Is that the last? Nope. That is the one that's halfway built, almost built right now on the right-hand side when you go on the cul-de-sac. So we're the ones who found religion praying we wouldn't find lead. Next to the White House? Yes. Okay. Next to the White House. The tree didn't fall on your house during the, No, my tree fell on the house. Oh, okay. And many trees fell on that house. We yeah. can have a whole tree park preservation yeah. conversation somewhere else. Um, I just, to that end, I mean, we're constituents too. We bought the land. There was an expectation that we could build a house. And in the middle of building this, this all came up. We also found out there was a whole other, I mean, this, as you all know, that we didn't know when we bought the land. We, we moved into Vermont three years ago. Um, I went to university up here. I have an affinity to Vermont. We decided to move our family up here for family reasons. Um, we didn't realize how challenging and crazy it would be to build on this road and disappointing it would be. Okay. Three years right now, and we're still not in since we started this process. One thing to consider was there was many people trying to block this property for years and it went to the state Supreme Court. There was a alternative that it could have been blasted. And this isn't strip mining. Um, my father worked in the bla blasting community for 30 years, before, 40 years before he passed. And the, they, the, this road was not allowed to do it because of the financial implications. Generally, when you blast, you have to inform people 250 meters. This went out to 1,500 meters to tell the houses. When you add that up, you have to offer an inspection to every single house in 1,500 meters. The chipping years ago in COVID, we were here doing COVID, could have ended in days. Wouldn't have been chipping. It just would have been blasting. And for the actual foundations, it's a poof and you're done. But we've kind of put regulation or regulation on top of this that has now hurt the entire community. And I think we're going to see more of this in other areas. I think that we'd ask the town to look at other alternatives and saying chip again, but only in these hours doesn't, you know, doesn't really address the, the concerns of our neighbors. And then number two is many houses were built over the years and there was noise. And now there's a new community coming in and new people coming in. And the feeling that we got was not very welcoming as new members of South Burlington. It was really disappointing. Luckily, we didn't have chip. Um, fortunately, some of our neighbors did. Um, but we're excited to be in the town now. Uh, as far as the lawnmower and the, the leaf blower, I would ask you to consider the cost on small business owners. Because there's a lot of small business owners just making it by. And I see some, uh, one gentleman who works for us, he's great, he's got a young family. But to tell him to completely convert his entire, all his machines over to meet this ordinance, I think if you do it, find ways to help our small businesses economically to be able to make this trans transition if that's something you want to do. There's got to be a timeline and we got to think about, think about them as well. So thanks for the time. Thank you very much. Next, come on down. Don't be bashful. Green light, you can hear me, okay. Jeannie Zagursti, um, I'm gonna take these off. I am definitely in support of adding decibels to the noise ordin ordinance, um, specifically for the loud construction noise. Um, I've learned recently through research and experts that anything above 60, 65 decibels can be extremely disruptive to the neighbors and cause stress, severe anxiety, um, lead to health issues, loss of hearing, uh, long-term down the road, dementia, all kinds of fun things. Um, building on rock ledge, I get that it has to happen sometimes, but it can be broken up. I've learned from jackhammering, or if not jackhammering, then drilling. Jackhammering decibel levels get to 118 decibels, and um, drilling gets to 123. I actually have an audio of the jackhammering that went on on long drive. Do you guys want to hear it or no? We've heard it, we've heard it before. Okay. 
So I'll skip that. It's really not. Either in person or in a recording that was played at a meeting. Okay. Okay. I live down across Dorset Street and I heard it from my house and I biked up to see what was going on last summer and I was like, oh my gosh. So yeah, that was not something that I thought would be very fun to be around. Um, we, there's going to be, the. let me back up, the Wheeler parcel section that was land swapped from the other area up behind 116 is we got the ruling on Friday. It is going to be moving forward with the Black Rock construction with the 32 homes on the 6.9 acres. Um, unfortunately, there's no mitigation strategy to stop um, the construction on even the blasting part because there were some houses that didn't require blasting, but many of them do. So I don't know when it's going to begin, but we had 60 people in the neighborhoods that gave us their names to sign up for, you know, no build out. We had 20 of those 60 that showed up as fact witnesses at the trial to voice their opinions and concerns about their health and, and the noise level and all of it to say, please don't do it. Um, it didn't work. Uh, it's going forward. So I am just here in support of definitely adding decibel levels to the noise ordinance and doing whatever we can to protect the neighbors, the wildlife, everybody around for a lot of reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Don't forget your name. My name is Amanda Hannaford, and uh, I live on Butler Drive. And I actually back up to Long Drive and moved in in June 2020. So I got to experience three years of, I, I've never lived there when there wasn't noise. Um, and it was kind of a joke with, you know, I was lucky to work from home during COVID. It was a joke because I disrupted every meeting I was at all day. It was like, oh, so, so it was kind of a joke. But um, I think I heard the word nuisance a few times. And I'm here to say I think it's really important to add decibels because it isn't just n nuisance. I think it's health and safety and it's permanent hearing damage. And, and I think we as citizens of Burlington sh should expect our city councilors and, and ask our city councilors to, um, to protect our health and safety. Um, I read, I, I heard this guy speak a few years ago, um, I think like 2019. And so I got this book and read it on, I, and I'll try to get you guys all copies. It has a ton of research with, with world experts and it's kind of a readable sort of, um, book. Um, but I, I do recommend that you speak to experts and find out what, noise causes um, learning impairment, permanent hearing damage, and other, um, other Ill, Ill effects. And there's just two quick um, quotes out of this book. Um, one is, when we talk about age-related hearing loss, the assumption is that it's something that happens to old people. It's something it is something that happens to old people, but it's something that's caused by things that we do when we are young. People who have trouble hearing tend to have more unrelated health issues of all kinds. It sort of overwhelms our brains. If you can't quite hear what people are saying, then you have to work harder to figure it out. And the brain power that you use to do that is brain power that you can't use for anything else. I actually stutter, so I have a really hard time trying to get words out. So it actually, it, so I understand that just from a speech um, point of view. Um, so, yeah, just please do something with decibels. And, and I do think I do agree that noise blower, um, leaf blowers, and other things are very loud, but it sh and we don't want to, I just think when you, when you say it's okay to have th this amount of noise, 
you're actually just outsourcing the cost of that to people who lose their hearing and then have to buy hearing aids, which are not covered by medical insurance. So, you know, so I, I think it's incredibly important. Thank you. Next, come on down. I left my speaker in the back. <laughs> Thank so. you. You're very welcome, but I did bring it. I'm Lisa Anger, and I live on 294 Golf Course Road. And you've heard from me before. I'm a little calmer now, and the only reason why is because there's no jackhammering going on. <laughs> However, if you look at me, I'm still shaking by just the thought of it. The word jackhammering just gives me this visceral reaction that I almost can't control. It is so harmful to the residents up there. There's no two ways about it. You heard last year, and if you didn't listen, if you weren't here, Lori, last year, which um, I think that we sent you the information that you need, people are going through chemo. People are sick. People are trying to work from home. And in the background, we're just trying to build some houses. Come on. There's so much property here. There's so much property that doesn't have ledge. We should be able to find people some, I feel bad for the other gentleman. I think he left. I feel really bad that it's taken them three years to build a house there. And I, I know that Beth is, is um, online, but there are so many things with this project that has just gone wrong, period. It just has. And every time someone jackhammers and they say, we're going to take out some of these trees, we're going to jackhammer, but all those trees that we took out, we're going to put so you don't have to see any of those homes. Come to my house, 294 Golf Course Road. You can see them. So where are those trees? Where is the li liability we keep on giving the developers? You're, 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 you're getting off track a little bit. We're no, I'm not. We're on the noise here. No, okay. we keep, well, I am a little bit because we keep giving the developers the right to build and we're not taking in the health of the people within the community. So when do we say, you know what, you have to do what you've done at least, like what you've committed to, and this is going off track, I agree with you, do what you say that you are going to do because we did listen to jackhammering because we were at least on the other side promised a little something, which still hasn't happened. I agree with decimals. Andrew, I'm so grateful for you and just bringing that up. I'm telling you, I don't know what I will do if that jackhammering starts again. I don't, but I think as a community, we will be rivaling back. I can tell you that because we can't handle it. Thank you. You're welcome. There was somebody else. Come on down, Christina. But only if you have more. Never mind. You're, Just kidding. You're holding all the chocolate. Hey, you're hanging on. No, I. I, I, <laughs> I shared mine. Yeah, I, I passed one down. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, State your name. No, okay. Christina Griffin. Um, I am speaking tonight on behalf of myself and some neighbors who are not able to attend this meeting. Um, I'd like to remind you of the strong showing of neighbors from a prior council meeting where this was, this came up previously. Um, I'll start with just, it was actually very timely today at my house. The landscapers for our neighborhood were trimming hedges around my home beginning at 7.30 a.m. until 3.30 p.m. except for a lunch break. Uh, there was near constant noise in my home with all the windows closed of between 65 and 75 decibels. This is a head from a hedge trimmer. When it was below 60 decibels, it was tolerable. Um, but when it was in the higher range, it was interfering with phone calls and meetings that I had going on. Um, I'd like to provide some insight into a typical week in our neighborhood with respect to noise and respectfully ask this council to consider the proposed consolidation and standards to the noise and nuisance ordinance. Um, so I live on Golf Course Road. Um, zooming out for a moment from my yard to the neighborhood, there are 29 homes on Golf Course Road, 30 townhomes on Golf Course Road, 36 on Fairway Drive, 52 on Park Road. So it's about 118 homes total in the neighborhood. Um, note that there are also 10 homes on Long Drive, some completed, some not, and then another 32 that are to be completed off, off of Park Road. Um, it takes a little over one full day from 7.30 a.m. to about 4 p.m. to mow and edge and remove all the grass clippings using multiple 
uh, loud, large deck walk behind mowers and multiple leaf blowers for the townhomes on Golf Course Road and Park Road. Another day to do this, same yard maintenance on Fairway Drive. Now, each of the 29 homes has yard maintenance as well. Uh, let's say that that takes, forgive me, it's late. I'm going to ask, ask you to follow me on the math here. <laughs> um, so each of the homes on my road has yard maintenance. It takes about, let's say, two hours. Most folks hire a lawn company, and they use the same mowers and leaf blowers. So that is, if you add it all together, 60 hours weekly of noise, um, assuming there are 45 hours in the week during which grounds crew, ground crews work, 7.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. This means that on any given day, Monday through Friday, between 7.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. or a little later, there is noise that it fluctuates between 64 and 78 decibels within, 50, within a 50-foot range from mowers and leaf blowers at all times. The people operating these are hearing 85 to 115 decibels, so I'm hoping that they're wearing ear protection. If you then also layer on the noise from Vermont National Golf Course, where the grounds crew mow and run leaf blowers to clear the greens and fairways multiple days of the week during golf season, Plus, up above, from the small planes, as were mentioned earlier in the meeting, flying overhead, the flight school at the airport has about 100 students per their website. Their one-hour lessons occur between 6 a.m. and 11 p.m. every day of the week. Let's say that each student flies just two hours per month. That's 6.6 .6 hours of noise each and every day, seven days a week, buzzing at low altitudes over our neighborhoods. This is aside from the alarming issue that they are burning leaded fuel that was raised earlier and dropping that over our neighborhoods for that same amount of time, 6.6 .6 hours every day. I bring this up aside from the issue that has already been mentioned about the rock hammering for the removal of ledge that other speak people have spoken eloquently to. And I respectfully ask our counselors to consider the proposed noise nuisance ordinance, which will align us with other communities that have already done the work and adopted similar ordinances. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Was there one more person? Come on up. Just please identify yourself. Hi, my name is Jill Knox. I live on Metalist Drive. Um, I don't really have anything additional to add. I just want to say that I support everything that's been said here tonight. I think a decibel limit um, is an absolute must. Thank you. I, I will also corroborate the um, low altitude general aviation <laughs> that flies over this cider mill uh, quite often. And, and some planes are quieter than others. I don't know what the difference is, whether it's the model, engine, whatever, but yeah, they, uh, well, then you add into that the uh, Army National Guard with the helicopters uh, sometimes at night and they come right over my house. <laughs> and you can also throw in a couple of other types of planes as well. Um, then we'll go there. We do have two folks online who we would do? like to speak. Who's, Beth who? and Judy. Oh, Beth Zygman, uh, unmute and you can speak right now, it, as long as you... It, Hello, I... It's, yeah, 10, it's 10 sorry, 20, sorry so, if I'm not, so if you, you don't repeat can, everything everybody else said, okay? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I will not repeat what others have said. Um, I will say that I strongly agree with everything that uh, Christina Griffin and Amanda Haddonford and, uh, and Lisa Angwin have said. Um, I do have a couple of things to add, however. I think that we definitely need a strong, enforceable nuisance ordinance that addresses noise with decibel limits. And I think that the best evidence for this is the what I consider to be a really outrageous agreement that was uh, signed by Jesse Baker and Adam Hergenrother regarding one of the properties on Long Drive, uh, which basically allows the developer to violate the nuisance ordinance. The agreement starts by saying that the hammering is a violation of the existing nuisance ordinance. So it establishes that they are violating the ordinance. Despite that admission, the city drafted a deal that allowed the developer to violate the ordinance. So if that's not admission that we have a problem with our nuisance ordinance, I don't know what is. Um, that agreement 
would expect citizens to move into a hotel for three days during the uh, during the jackhammering. And I, I sent um, I sent this information to all of the new councillors. Um, Andrew Chalnick and, and Tim Barrett were on the council when a lot of this stuff happened back in October of last year. Um, but anyway, the result of that is this agreement that was struck with one of the developers that would actually put the onus on the citizens of the town to move into a hotel because the noise is so disruptive and the city admits that the noise is that disruptive. Um, there was a radius of 500 feet specified in that agreement um, for people who I guess would be paid by the developer to move out of their homes for three days so that they could hammer on those lots. Um, that doesn't even come close to covering the number of homes that are impacted by that noise. That covers about 10 homes within the, uh, within the radius that was established in that agreement. Um, the city also admits in that document, and again, I, I don't know if the council was made aware of this agreement that, um, that Ms. Baker signed with Adam Hergenrother, but the city also admitted that there were several workarounds and mitigation measures that the developer could have taken. Therefore, the only reason for striking that deal was to protect the developer from incurring additional costs for mitigating the noise. And, you know, while I understand the importance of, you know, small businesses and developers, et cetera, being able to do what they need to do to make a living, I do not believe that that should come at the expense of the health and well-being and peace of the communities. Um, and that's that's a point that I would I would also apply to the leaf blowers. Um, I totally agree with everything Christina Griffin said. Um, we have a tremendous amount of noise pollution in our neighborhood. I'm sure this is true across the city. Um, there are other cities throughout the country who have enacted ordinances that prevent the uh, the use of, of um, internal combustion engine leaf blowers. We have a we have an electric lawnmower and it is very quiet by comparison. Those lawnmowers are not expensive anymore and there could be a, a simple phase in or well phase out of the gas burning uh, variety and a phase in of the electric uh, uh, lawnmowers and leaf blowers. Um, that's the end of my comments. Um, I think my husband also wants to comment if if we could take the time to give him if we could give him a little bit of time to speak as well. Uh, well, we didn't see his face earlier and somebody else wants to comment first. So let's get back to you. Okay. 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 Yeah, we can wait. Okay. Thanks. I'll put the hand back up. Thank you. Who was that other? Judy. Judy, can you hear me? Can We can't hear you, Judy, even though you seem to be unmuted. We still can't hear you. Do you have your mic muted on your laptop or tablet besides the meeting mute? And we still can't hear you. Can you hear us? Okay. Well, let's go back to the Zygmunds real quick. Oh, and hold on. Hold on. Judy, I'm going to put, if you can see the chat, in the chat is a phone number where you can call in if you would like to turn log off the computer and call in on the phone, we should be able to hear you. That worked earlier for somebody. The phone number is in the chat. Okay, then we're gonna to go to John. Good evening. Uh, again, not to retread everything, many of the points have been made very eloquently. Uh, I'm fully in favor of the, the changes to the legislation, to the nuisance ordinance. A uh, couple things that I would like to, to go over that I don't think have been covered yet. Um, one, it's been referenced that the la this last came to a head 10 months ago, and we're now in the exploratory phase of doing something. Um, we got really lucky this year that the house that was built did not end up having ledge. So we could have had a big problem and we didn't, but I would urge the council to try and do something specifically about the construction noise, the ledge, before we get into construction season next time. There are, I believe, five lots left on the, on the long drive parcel, maybe six, and I don't think anyone knows how much ledge is still there. 
So please, let's do something before this becomes a crisis. Um, I would also like to urge you to not think that that agreement that was signed between the city and I think it's Sunstone now, they keep changing their names, um, is a solution to anything. Um, I find that agreement just incredibly poorly conceived. Uh, if you look at it, Section 8 lists a number of things that the developers could do to eliminate the need to chip rock. Why were those things not required of the developer before they were given permission to disrupt the neighborhood and got a waiver for the noise ordinance and were able to make this noise? How do you not tell them, try and design around it, try and use less noisy methods? All these things that are clearly enumerated in that agreement. And they were said to do that after their three days, if that wasn't enough time. It is completely nonsensical. Um, I, I can't stress enough how badly conceived I think that agreement was. And quite frankly, uh, I think our city manager greatly overstepped her authority and stumbled right into policy matters. And the city council should have been involved because I would certainly like to think the council never would have approved uh, something like this. So please do something before this becomes a crisis again. And again, I, I'm in favor of all this. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Do you want me to address the agreement? In um, if you'd like to, uh, it's 1030 now. I, I think we've heard a lot of input from the public and we've had discussion among ourselves. Do you want to answer that now? It's up to you. Can I'm you happy to give the community my rationale if that's useful to folks, but ultimately I'm accountable to the five of you, so it's up to you. Can we try to get Judy connected? But, Do are, we? are we going to be discussing this in executive session or have a full discussion now, I guess is the question. We must talk about the li the legal liability in executive session, but I can talk to you about my my decision making in open session. Any thoughts? I'm just wondering if we can connect um, Judy Wright. If we've had any luck there? No, I don't think so. Um, I think I'd prefer to go to an executive session for this. Uh, to be honest, okay. um, so I think I'll just wait until the next uh, last agenda item. All right. So um, at this point, we've had a lot of input, and uh, the, the council's talked about it a little bit. Um, I guess the next step is what? Uh, can you just wait till I finish here? What? What? Where is the priority on this for the next agenda item, which is going back to item twelve, which is uh, policies, priorities, and strategies. Um, I, you know, obviously this is an important issue. Um, I, I personally think that we, we need to address uh, whatever is needed to prevent um, jackhammering. And um, also it would be nice to get rid of uh, leaf blowers. Those are the two top in my, my playbook. Um, but we need staff to, to do this, you know, investigation and on how to structure this. So. Uh, do we want to switch over to item 12 right now and talk about that, or it's 1030? Quick question. Sure. Um, <clears throat> and we may want to address this after item 12, but in order for staff to do anything with this, Jesse, do you need just direction from us, or do you need a a, um, a vote of, of majority to move forward with anything with this issue? Uh, I, I mean, this has been a really interesting conversation. I think I have enough content from you all or questions, you know, where you would need information. I would need three of you to tell us to, it's going to take a significant amount of staff time, so I need three of you to tell us to prioritize this over other things. Okay. Thank you. So if we, uh, is there one last quick comment? Yeah. Okay. Come on down. This is the last one. Then we have to move on. Amy Allen, Long Drive, um, 80 Long Drive. Um, I really think this is a case where subtraction is a better solution than addition. Remove the onerous regulations on blasting and do the data gathering needed for this. Okay. Compare and contrast the noise levels and lengths of time for blasting versus chipping. Find out how many lawn and landscaping businesses will be affected and the jobs and the families associated um, and what it will cost them. 
Regulation without data leads to bad ordinances that hurt people. Thank you. Thank you. So do we want to spend a lot of time on 12 at this point, at this hour, or do we just want to... Next time. We have to defer this one again. We've deferred this a few times, right? Well, it, it, you know, I, I know one thing I mentioned in my notes is I, I would much prefer to have this conversation in sort of retreat part two. Um, so I, I feel it's important to give ourselves a chunk of time um, to really, the, the work plan as it exists is, I think, too much for both council and staff. Um, so I feel like we owe it to uh, the community and staff and ourselves to really prioritize what is on this master list and come up with a realistic plan that acknowledges kind of all the competing needs we have. That's what I would support at this yeah, point, Tim. I agree with that. And I would, I would, I would propose that um, we reserve any decision on directing staff until after we have the um, executive session this evening. Agree with that? Mike? Yes, I definitely, I, I, I've said it all this evening. We definitely need to focus on our priorities. We need to get our, our the master plans going and everything will fit into it because these are all interrelated challenges and, and therefore I think we will do better as a community if, if we take all the, the components into part and the, and the and just in our team have their guidance on what are the sequencing and priorities to get us there. So and I, that's I, going to require a retreat. So I agree with all that. One one thing we should keep in mind is, you know, strategic long-term decisions versus tactical decisions to address immediate needs. And we have an immediate need that could be addressed, I think, pretty simply, pretty swiftly, pretty easily while we consider some more of the nuances and some more of the strategic questions that the city is facing. So we need to be nimble. We need to be able to chew gum, right, and walk at the same time. Um, so as we think about our positive and priorities, we should separate some of these actions in those different categories. Thanks. All right, well, in that case, we're going to move on to item 14. Hold on. <laughs> Whoa. I'm trying to get this moving, man. When do you want to do retreat number two? We well, don't have a date for that. <laughs> exactly. Soon. Soon. So I, I think, do we, right the now, we, have we are holding. Meetings. We, <laughs> yep. August is pretty much filled up. August is pretty much filled up. Yep. Right now, I think all of you are holding September 11th for facility tours. Mm. So instead of that, we could do a retreat. That's probably a good idea. Great idea. Okay. Start in. We still don't get our tour. Maybe we could hold it at the wastewater treatment plant. But, uh, but, before, but I, I, I just, can I, I, I don't think we need to wait a month or we should wait a month to talk about, for, to have staff do some investigation on simply adding an objective decibel level to our nuisance ordinance. I think it's our responsibility as a council to address these severe impacts that the community has articulated and again be nimble in addressing those impacts. Andrew, I agree with that. And two things. One, I think that um, I would like, I personally would like to defer that until after we meet an executive session because I feel that we as council need some more information before we choose how to move forward with that. Number one. And number two, I just want to say um, that um, I'm going to just say a vote of support for our city manager, Jesse Baker, um, who made an executive decision that while maybe unpopular, I think that the rationale that she had for it that I have heard um, makes sense from a tactical standpoint for protecting the neighborhood, whether it looks good legally or et cetera. We need to discuss that in executive session, but I just wanted to provide that voice of support. Thanks, Lori. 
Tim, can I make one comment? Um, I, I don't disagree with the Andrew. I, I'm reticent to jump to provide or to providing direction to staff to focus on a decibel level. I think the primary issue is any properties that might have permits in place or or construction plan that have ledge that might require that chipping. I think that is the level of specificity that st staff should be anticipating kind of how to deal with that personally. And I just don't want to jump to a solution that ha might have a lot of collateral impact that we can't even anticipate yet. Um, because I think I think that is the primary issue that we know about right now, and the, and I think properties are probably in queue that we could identify that have ledge. Good point. Okay. All right, Mike. Is Mike. And I also think uh, we should give staff a chance to uh, give us their ideas uh, on what other. Uh, options there are to move things forward, especially in terms of incentivizing uh, movement away from, uh, if we're talking about a lot of blowers, I think we, it, you know, I, I think there needs to be a good uh, broad discussion on not only what are the objectives, but how to get there in a way that uh, will be followed quickly uh, in the most expedient way and cost effective way for the, all those involved. So. I agree, the executive session discussion is important, but also in the context of how we use our resources following that. Thanks, Mike. All right, let's 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 get to the uh, item 14, liquor control, so we can get to our executive session. I need a motion. I so move that we enter a uh, liquor control body. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 We're now aye. In, in Liquor Control Commission, and we uh, need a motion to uh, for the following applications for approval. Um, let's see. I move to approve the following 2024 first and third class liquor license and outside construction permits uh, for the inn at Burlington, a first class hotel license, and Myers Wood Fired third class restaurant bar license and outside consumption permit. Second. So we have a motion and second. I have discussion. Where's the inn at Burlington? Why is it in South Burlington? The La Quinta, the former La Quinta. It's rebranded. Uh, oh, the Quinta. La Quinta. Yeah. La Quinta. Quinta. Now it's called the Inn at Burlington. Mm -hmm. well, in they, South Burlington. Did they? Oh, it's kind of like the airport. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> great. Um, okay. I so. can't believe it's a fact about South Burlington that Tim doesn't know. I'm just amazed. <laughs> I'm dumbfounded. It's just called the Inn at BTV. So, uh, any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 And it's unanimous. Mm -hmm. And now we need a motion to come out of liquor control. Move to come out of liquor control. Second. second. Third. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous again. Is there any other business? Yes, please. Yes. So, I, I just, um, in the, my interest of not disappointing you, want to go over what is currently on your next council agenda mm -hmm. and ask if either now or in the next week you have priority requests, we would be happy to entertain those. So you have now a public hearing for sewer and stormwater ordinance and a possible action. You have Helen Reilly talking about the airport. You have the Wagner Hodgson's presentation on city green concepts. Mm -hmm. You have the planning commission presenting to you all the S100 LDR changes not policies and strategies. You have the charter committee coming in to recommend, make a, revisit their recommendation on expanding the council. You have pickleball recommendation at Szymanski Park. You have an ARPA conversation about the change guidance saying we have to approve, we have to spend the funds by December 31st. Now you have school safety at Rick Mark Hot School and you have two executive sessions, one on labor negotiations as we enter into negotiations with the police union and one on land acquisition associated with the long property. I am happy to not have a 12-hour meeting, but it would really be helpful to me to know which of those you all are okay pushing off. So it's in your inbox. It's on the agenda planner. Um, guidance would be greatly appreciated. Or we can talk about doing the executive sessions first, or we could talk about another mm -hmm. option. Personally, I think we can move offer. 
because we will we'll need to digest some of that. Honestly, so. So the, the challenge for ARPA, just to preview this to you, I think I put this in one of your Friday emails, is the U.S. Treasury guidance has changed. So we have to be under contract to allocate by right. December 30th. But again, Jesse, isn't it really sure. trivial because we, can't we just be under contract to buy a fire truck or pay employees and know that we still yes. have those funds because it's more money? You can do that, yes. okay. but you need to make a decision to <laughs> yes. do that. Yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks. So if there's no other uh, business and motion to adjourn. So moved. Are we adjourning or going no, into no, executive no. session? Oh, you have. Sorry. Oh, um, sorry. I'm sorry. We, we're going to go into executive session and we will not be coming back. Andrew, can you just read those? Sorry. Of course. I sorry. I jumped ahead. Um, at item 16, we have, we have a motion for executive session and, and we will not be coming back after that. I move that the council make a specific, a specific finding that premature general public knowledge of the council's discussion of pending or probable civil litigation or prosecution to which the city may be a party and confidential attorney-client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services to the council would clearly place the public body at a substantial disadvantage. Second. Second. Oh. Elizabeth, you're quick. <laughs> we have a motion a second. Is there any discussion? I have just a question. Yep. How, how, how do I do this from here? Um, Michael, I sent you a calendar invite for a, with a Zoom link in it for executive session. That was the 9 o'clock one? Yeah, okay, so I will just one. switch over to that now. One second, works. one second, Michael. If one more may, motion. In a minute. Yeah, just wait. Okay, we have a okay. motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 So I now aye. move that the city council enter into executive session under one VSA 313A1E and F for the purpose of discussing pending or probable civil litigation or prosecution to which the city may be a party and confidential attorney-client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services to the council, inviting Jesse Baker, Steve Locke, Colin McNeil, and Paul Connor into session with council for the discussion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, it's unanimous. And we will not be coming back. Thank you, everybody.